research is required. It's why paleontology is such an exciting science. It's like we're always learning new things all the time. It's a mountain skeleton. Um, really, really cool. Hello there, everybody, and welcome back to Paleontologizing. Hope you guys all had a wonderful weekend. It is really great to see you here today, and I hope you're ready for a fun and informative stream. For anybody who might be new here, let me introduce myself real quick. My name is Danny Anduza, and I'm a dinosaur paleontologist. I'm here on Twitch, trying to do some good old-fashioned science outreach, answering people's questions, you know, sharing my enthusiasm for fossils and the wonderful history of life on our planet. Uh, so yeah. If you are new here, I'm really glad you're here. And uh, I'm gonna get started in just a minute. But first, as is our custom here, let me go down through chat and uh, welcome everybody to go ahead and kick off the stream. Uh, oh, and before I do that, I should let you know, not only is this a late stream today, I'm streaming about an hour later than I normally do from here in my office, because, uh, well, I've got a ton of stuff to get ready before I leave on a weeks-long road trip, visiting different museums and field sites uh, all across the American Intermountain West, and I may even be doing some field work here, too. We'll have to see. Why I felt kind of naked. I don't have my necklace on. Hang on just a second. Let me grab that. Ugh. There we go. I knew something was missing. Uh, let me put that on. And let's see who's here right now. Mayor Space, hello to you. How are you doing? Hope you're having a good day so far. Um, and uh, thank you for everything you do, Mayor Space. It's one of our very loyal mods, as well as Claire Burr. How are you doing, Claire? Good to see you. Hope uh, your week is off to a good start, and I hope you had a great weekend. Um, and I heard your internet was out for a good while there. I'm sorry to hear that, Claire. I'm glad it's back on. Cooking with Lordy, dinosaurs indeed. How are you doing, Lordy? Uh, welcome back. Yeah, Lordy, is it okay if I tell everybody about uh, news this summer? Or should we keep that a surprise? Um, and Belint, thank you so much for the three months there. I really appreciate that. Thank you kindly. Support means a lot to me. It really does. Ah. Uh -huh. We've got our new notification set up. I... I need to turn that up in terms of volume there. We'll see if I can do that real quick. Um, got a whole new notification setup, um, which I'll be troubleshooting a little bit today, like I'm doing right now. All right, alerts and overlays, edit. Is there like a... Box one, settings, hmm. 100% for those. Hang on everybody, just a minute. 100% for those, come on. 100% uh, for these, I don't know why these are all different from one another. Um, and yeah, okay, save. I guess I don't have the raids one ready yet. Hopefully that fixes it. All right, let's continue on with the greetings. Um, Balint says, hello, sir. I hope you had a great weekend and a day today. I'm ready to learn. All right, Balint, I'm so glad you're here. Thank you again for your support. That means a lot to me. Izzy, how are you doing? Good to see you. Hope you had a great weekend. Hey. Thank you. For those hundred bits. <laughs> Whoever you are, you are as generous as you are mysterious, anonymous gifter. Thank you very much for those hundred bits. That's lovely. Um, maybe I should turn the music down just a tad or something. Or have... Hmm, I don't know how well you could hear the, uh, the notification there. Might have to have ducking for that. Uh, let's see here. Mistrictian, how are you doing? 
Welcome back. Good to see you. It's great seeing you on Friday, too. Visible Dimensions, good to see you as well. Hope you had a good weekend. And let's see here. Moving on down through chat. Ironheart, what's shaking? Good to see you. And Young Lane, I don't think I've seen you here before, have I? Doesn't say it's your first time chatting, but welcome back to Paleontology. Uh, Madam33, how are you doing? Good to see ya. Green Panthera says, good evening, Bone Lord. Your eyebrows are looking finely groomed. Thank you? Is that a compliment? I'm not sure. Um, Zooland Man, how are you? I dig that Apatosaur. Hope you're doing well. And Fossil Vet, how are you doing? Good to see you, Fossil Vet. Um, oh, Fossil Vet, also, I should tell you, uh, I did find Paleo, but, like, just, I want you to know that I'm not going to be taking Paleo with me into the field this summer. I've been looking at all the gear that I need to take with me, and there is just too much stuff. And also, you know, who knows what's going to happen over the, over the course of the summer. Um, I don't want to lose this gift that you sent me. Um, I'm grateful for it, but I'm not going to be taking it with me. I just want you to know that. Um, so yeah, yeah, I hope that's okay with you. Um, Lindsay says, will you be doing streams during the fieldwork, Danny? Well, Lindsay, if I'm doing fieldwork, I will probably be streaming, yeah, as long as I have signal. Um, Paul Warren Dublin, thank you for the six months. Holy cow. I really appreciate that, Paul Warren Dublin. That's half a year right there. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, and let's see. And Lordy says, do tell. I'm so excited about it. All right. Remind me, Lordy, and I'll, I'll make an announcement after I get through chat. Um... Let's see. Mm -hmm. And let's see. Mr. Strickling says, yeah, today's the last day of my vacation. So I'll be going back to being somewhat hit and miss. All right, Mr. Strickling. I'm going to have a very irregular streaming schedule over the course of the rest of the summer, too. So it might be hit and miss for a lot of people here. Uh, but yeah, I'm going to be doing a lot of different museum streams. I'm going to be doing some on-the-road streams, probably. I might be doing some fieldwork streams, too. So, it should be an interesting summer. Um, gonna be kind of all over the place. Uh, there's a lot to prepare for, because I'm basically gonna be on the road for... at least... three weeks? Possibly as long as, like, two months? <laughs> yeah, there's a lot going on, and I... Again, this is why this stream is gonna be a little bit short today, too. Because I have a lot of stuff to get done today. And I'm leaving on Thursday. Uh, there's so much to do before then. So I'm really hoping I can fit all of my essential stuff into the vehicle. But, uh, but we'll see. Yeah. Um, let's see. Should get too dirty? Yeah, Claire. Probably, yeah. Yeah. Izzy Black says, I'm better now that I can watch your stream. I saw a person doing a sculpture of a dino. I forget the species, but it looks like Triceratops. But smaller. I give a link to Claire. Cool, is he? Cool. Yeah. Um, and Fossil Vet says, okay, it's okay, Danny. Completely understand? Thank you, Fossil Vet. I appreciate your understanding. Uh, I'm just a little bit nervous about telling you, to be honest. So thank you for being awesome. I appreciate that. Um, yeah. And uh, let's see. Fossil Vet says, hey, Danny, can you at least give Paleo a guest appearance on the stream, please? Not today, I can't. I'm actually... Uh, I brought... Paleo over to Ios's place. So, in order to keep her? Keep her safe. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. Uh, you can ask Ios on her stream, and uh, we'll see if we can do something about that. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I had a, a friend's dog who kept coming over, making appearances at my apartment, and uh, so, like, anything that's chew upable, I had to put well out of the way. Um, so yeah, and I really didn't want anything to happen to Paley over the course of the summer if I'm not going to be here, you know. So yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. And uh, Izzy says, for the on-location streams, will the captions be working? I don't think so. I'm going to see if I can find another third-party application for this, Izzy. But I can't make any promises, unfortunately. Um, right now, the captions that I have right now are with stream closed captioner. That's this right here, which is on Google Chrome. Um, and I'm not gonna be able to do that during the summer. I 
There's captions now. Uh, could you hear that? I wonder. Um, uh, yeah, there are captions now, Lil Dabby Nate. Thank you for the three months of support. By the way. I really appreciate that. <laughs> Uh, am I just gonna have to like way raise the volume on all those? Could you hear any of that, everybody? Um, but yeah. Anyway, uh, music musician's life is always on the road too. Yeah, dimensions. This is true. Oftentimes. And chaotic goo dog. Hey, this is how I just got here. Are dinosaurs real? What about Jesus? What about? Do you have a friend named Jesus? Uh, and dinosaurs are indeed real, yeah. I, I don't know what to tell you. Um, if you stick with me this summer, I'll be showing you a lot of real dinosaur fossils, including some I might be digging up live. <laughs> New notification, thank you for that. Uh, Zeal Dan for that follow. And Mother Vera, thank you for the follow as well. Welcome, you two. It's great to have you here. Um, welcome to Paleontologizer. Paddle says, hi, Danny. Have you checked with the museums to make sure it's okay to live stream inside them? It will be okay for most of them. They're public institutions. I'm not going to be disruptive or anything. So, yeah. Um, and be careful with streaming in national parks. They typically require permits. I'll look, I will have to check about that, Paddle. Um, I know for BLM land, Bureau of Land Management land, which is a kind of federal land administered by the Department of the Interior, it's totally find a live stream there as long as you don't have like a crew and sets and stuff like that um i've checked and i've talked to some people um and uh, mr Kidney says do we have a link to ios i haven't been able to follow her yet yeah we'll do a shout out for ios there thank you there lordy um yeah yeah uh, and it's hearable okay little dabby name uh is he black i'm so glad you like the notifications yeah i've got a bunch of those. And I'm going to be adding even more when I have some time. So, yeah. It honestly took me way too long to put those notifications together. It was a lot of work, but they're there. Yeah. Um, please post them somewhere so I can learn all of them. I don't know how to post them, Claire. Uh, I don't have, like, a spreadsheet or anything. Um, but yeah. Uh, you're awesome. Thank you, Izzy. Hey, I... I try. And I, I try and, you know, I try and make this accessible to everybody. Um, I know that, you know, you really appreciate the captions, and I'm going to do my best to see if I can find something for the summer. But I can't make you any promises. I'll do my best, okay? Um, yeah. Uh, and Mr. Thien, yeah, good luck with that. Um, lot going on. Art Chappy, how are you doing? Good to see you. Man, it is getting warm in here. I gotta turn on that fan. Just a second. That's a little bit better. Ah. And, uh, oh, and I forgot to turn on my, uh, my lights, too. Hang on a second. I think the remote fell down there. Hang on. Just a jiff here. Okay, that's a little bit better. Uh, hopefully this doesn't crash the stream, but there we go, yeah. A different view for everybody. Um, with the Tyrannosaurus skeleton up there. Not sure, sure why this is all blurry again, but that's okay. We've got multiple cameras. So if one's not working, we can switch to the other. Uh, and let's see. Mm-hmm. Green Panthera. <laughs> there are some dinosaur names like that that are kind of tongue-in-cheek or semi-jokey. Um, including one that I'm an author on, actually. Yeah. And Izzy, he? Oh, that is really sweet of you to say. And the music is a bit loud? Okay, let me turn it down just a little bit. Um, oh, you know what? Here's my solution, I think. I betcha I can... 
Turn the music down a little bit. There we go. Turn it down a little bit in uh, Windows Media Player. Turn it up here. That might solve our notifications issue. We shall see. Um, yeah. Very nice, Lenina. Hey! How are you doing, Lenina? Welcome back. Really good to see you. Um, yeah. And I completely agree with what Claire said right there, too. Thank you so much, everybody. Holy cow. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, some quick sub or something. <laughs> and, uh, let's see. Grarg, hey. Welcome to Paleontologizing. How you doing, Grarg? We had the dinosaurs now. There we go. Thank you so much, Lordy, for those hundred bits. I really appreciate that a lot. Was that audible right there? Could you hear it? Thank you for helping me test this. Uh, but yeah, yeah, excellent. All right, all right. Art Chappie says, what is the next fossil you're gonna get? Like the next fossil I'm gonna 3D print or something like that? I don't know. My 3D printer is actually out of commission right now. Um, no expense. Holy cow, Lenina! Gifted Christy Gates a subscription. The Lenina gifted at your one stop to Christy Gates. Thank you so much, Lenina. Ten gift subs in the channel. Ten gift subs. That's awesome, Lenina. I really appreciate that support. Thank you very, very much. I love that everybody's so excited about the new notifications too. Um, but yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, Art Chappie, I don't know which which uh, fossil I'm gonna print next. I don't know which fossils I'm going to collect in the field next. Those, of course, would not go to me. Those would go to whatever museum I happen to be working with. Because as we all know, uh... That belongs in a museum! When it comes to important vertebrate fossils. Uh, but yeah. Yeah. And, uh, that's much better. Not quite loud enough, but close. Well... Let me turn this up a little bit. And then turn this volume down a little bit. And see if that gets us there. But yeah. Uh, and Izzy says, I need to get a Utah Raptor and T-Rex. Pretty cool. That would be really neat. Um, I don't know if there's an available... I don't think we actually have a skull of Utah Raptor. I don't think we really know what Utah Raptor's skull looked like yet. You know what? Actually, let me check. You know who might be able to tell us uh, without speaking a single word? It might be... Uh, Scott Hartman. Scott Hartman. Uh, Utah Raptor. Skeletal drawing. Mm. There we go. Not Pinterest. Let's go to skeletaldrawing.com. Um, Utah Raptor. Uh, here we go. Uh, do we actually have a skull, though? I mean, he shows every part of it being represented here. And of course, the Utah Raptor, it's a great big dromaeosaur, much like uh, the Velociraptors from Jurassic Park. But unlike the Velociraptors from Jurassic Park, Utah Raptor is we really robust. Fight with monsters. We came here to find fossils. Thank you so much, OG King. I really appreciate the follow. Welcome to Paleontologizer. Um... Yeah, so this is how Utah Raptors should look nowadays. Uh, but do we have... I don't know if we actually have a good skull yet. Um, I don't know. That's something that I'd love to learn over the course of the summer. I will be in Utah for a while, and I might well see some good Utah Raptor material. So, yeah. Um, maybe, maybe we can discover that together. Uh, but anyway, yeah, let's see. Uh, let's see here. Uh, the soundboard is being raised with notification sounds. Um, oh, that's right, Clara. This is a good point. Uh, I wonder if I can change the volume. I can on the soundboard. Let's put that down to half. Here, let's test it. That belongs in a museum. I think that might be good. It might be a little quiet. Let me know. Um... Yeah, let's see. And Everest Clara, how are you doing? Sorry, but I don't mean to make it hot. 
No, you're just sneaking in. You're welcome. Uh, one of the dig streams, Danny. Filthy Badger. I'm working on that right now. Let me tell you how the summer's gonna go so far. This coming Thursday, I'm gonna be leaving on a great big kind of, I would say cross country road trip, but I'm not going all the way across the country. I'm just, as far as I know, going to, uh, I'm probably gonna be going as far as like South Dakota and then back. Um, I'm gonna be visiting various museums and field sites kind of as a, as a visitor, I guess, for the first few weeks, um, up until the end of July. Uh, so yeah, I'll be live streaming from museums and probably from some outdoor field sites as well. And then I'm going to be attending the Dino Shindig in Ekalaka, Montana, which is this really cool gathering for, you know, a bunch of paleontologists and people from eastern Montana get together and just kind of celebrate fossils. It's... It's a pretty cool event, and uh, I hope I hope you'll join me for that. Uh, so I'll be doing that, and then I'm going to be going east to Bozeman, Montana, and streaming from Bozeman, and possibly also from Yellowstone National Park. I'll have to check on that, see if that's feasible. Um, yeah, and then, after that, we kind of hit a crossroads. I'm either going to be going out and doing some field work, I still have to hear back, about that. I sent out some emails today. Uh, so that might go, I don't know how long if I end up doing field work. Um, and hopefully I can stream it too if we have happen to have uh, like cellular network coverage. Uh, but if that doesn't happen, if I don't end up doing field work, then here's the plan. Lordy from the Cooking with Lordy channel is going to be accompanying me uh, if I'm not doing field work, and we are going to be doing a great big, like, gigantic road trip that's going to take us most of the way across the country. Um, we'd be going east as far as the Great Lakes, visiting museums along the way, and streaming pretty much every day, we think. Um, and then we'll be going southwest, down through dinosaur country, and to the Grand Canyon, and then we'll be going up through California, to get back to Oakland. It's gonna be a big trip. So those are the those are the two possibilities here. Either I'm gonna be doing field work, which is gonna be super awesome, or I'm gonna be going on a super awesome road trip with Lordy. So we really can't lose. It's gonna be a great summer either way. Um, I'm really not sure which one of those I would be more excited for, to be honest. Uh, so yeah, yeah, it's gonna be pretty rad. I'm, I'm very excited. Uh, yeah. And Balin says, one of the dig sites, what is the role you have? Like visiting scientist slash digging scientist? Not sure how these work. Well, Balin, that's a great question. Uh, the crew that I'm talking to right now, I have done a lot of work with in the past. And so I would be officially, I guess officially a volunteer and then I wouldn't be getting paid. In fact, I would actually be contributing funds to the institution and the fieldwork. Um, but I'd basically be like a visiting researcher slash... I don't know. I, I don't really have an official title, but I've done a lot of work with this crew before, and it would be... Uh, uh, I don't know. I know them really well. And... Yeah, t titles are difficult when it comes to this kind of thing. I don't know. Um, but I'd basically be doing everything that the whole rest of the crew is doing. From probably... You know, not just excavation and mapping and jacketing the fossils and, um, you know, helping transport them, but also maybe doing things like taking sections, um, maybe even some prospecting, that kind of thing, too. Trying to find some new fossils as well. Uh, since it is toward the end of the summer, we might, if, again, if I join up with this crew, uh, one of my main goals is going to be to help them wrap up the field season. The end of the field season is the most work and at that point the rest of the crew is really tired and so I would be uh, kind of like calling in the cavalry you know uh, but yeah yeah uh, Everest Claris's curses how did he see me through my clever inflatable T-Rex costume <laughs> uh, and let's see here Rodan says don't forget to get a picture of the two-headed calf 
At the museum in Ikalaka, you mean? Yeah, I definitely will. I have some photos of that I could show you. Uh... Oh, and Mr. Teen, I really appreciate that, yeah. I don't think I will be going through Helena, but... I'm not sure. Um... Yeah, I'll let you know, if I am. Um, but I really appreciate that, Mr. Ictian. That means a lot to me. Uh, they don't open till 5. <laughs> uh, yeah. And Lordy says, Eek, I'm so excited. I hope Danny gets field work, but I also hope we get to do a road trip. Yeah. It's going to be great either way, and there's going to be a ton of awesome streams to watch either way. Honestly, there might be more streams to watch if we do the big road trip. In fact, there will almost certainly be more streams to watch if we do the big road trip. But yeah, yeah, I really can't lose. It's going to be a good rest of the summer. Uh, yeah. And it's kind of interesting how, like, I don't know, I started off so late this summer. I was teaching until, like, mid-June. Normally, I'm in the field by the beginning of June. And so, yeah, like, getting in contact with crews and stuff, not only... Was I late in doing that? And so I may have missed some opportunities there because I was just too busy to do this while I was teaching. But also there's all kinds of COVID stuff going on. And a lot of field crews still aren't out this summer doing field work because of COVID-19. So it's an unusual summer. I see this as kind of like a, like a practice round for like a big field extravaganza next summer. Uh, it's going to be good. Yeah, it's going to be good. Uh, 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 uh. And thank you, Mr. <laughs> uh, Maui Girl says, Hi, Danny. You need to come see me when you're in Arizona? Ma I was hoping you would say that, Maui Girls. Everybody, Maui Girls is a relative of mine. Um, just to be clear. Uh, so yeah, I would, I would love to. I'm going to be coming through... If I am coming through Arizona, it'll probably be... Around... What would it be? Probably like August 11th? Something like that? Um, yeah, yeah. So I really appreciate the offer. Maybe we can make that happen. We're going to be visiting the Grand Canyon and uh, kind of going down... I forget which highway you take to get to LA, but that's our basic route. Um, and I think you are somewhere along there, right? Yeah. Send me a text if you remember... I'll try to remember, too. I'll try to remember to send you a text. And, uh, yeah, yeah. Because it'd be great to see you again. It's been a super long time. This is Laura Dern of Jurassic Park. There we go. Up dinosaurs is hard, frustrating work. It takes months or years, so leave it to the professionals. It's not a moon. Thank you for the follow. I appreciate that. Thanks for triggering that new notification. Um, welcome to Paleontologizer. It's not a moon. It's good to have you here. Uh... Let's see. Uh, and Lenina says, cool, be sure to find out if there's a way we can kick some bucks their way. To the field crew? Yeah, yeah. I, uh... Well, I can show you something. Um... Do we have it there? Well, okay. I set up a charity page type thing. I never officially launched it. Um... Really spectacular. Spared no expense. Holy cow, paddle! One hundred and twenty-three <laughs> gifted Maui girls. Nineteen a subscription. Thank Barry you. One hundred and twenty-three gifted a tier one sub to Maui girls. Nineteen. Thank you so much, paddle. Twenty-nine gift subs in the channel. Twenty-nine. Wow. Thank you so much, paddle. One, two, three. I really appreciate that. I really, really do. And uh, you chose a very worthy recipient. Maui girls is my aunt. Um. So yeah, my dad's sister. So. uh... Yeah, there you go, Auntie. <laughs> uh, and let's see. Yoga Girl says, sounds like a fun summer no matter what happens. Yeah, it is going to be great. It really is. Um, and cool, Mr. Ictian, I really appreciate that. Yeah. And James Gurney says, so aside from the love of the field, if you're not paid, what do you get out of it? I couldn't do microbiology for free on the summer on my salary. Yeah, James Gurney, that's, that's a great question. I used to get paid. Um, back before I had, like, another year-round job, um, I've managed to put away enough money from two and a half years of teaching, 
that I can kind of support myself for a while. And I'm also making some money here on Twitch, too. The goal, ultimately, is to be able to make enough money on here that I can kind of support myself and, you know, continue to be a freelance paleontologist without starving. So, that's the really cool thing that, like, it's really cool that Twitch can potentially enable me to do that, you know? Um, yeah. Because it's kind of a dream of mine to, to be able to, you know, carry out research, publish papers, go out and do field work, and not have to deal with all of the super time-consuming stuff that people in a more traditional academic setting have to deal with. Writing grant proposals, attending committee meetings, doing this and that and the other thing, you know, teaching, TAing, um, all kinds of administrative stuff. Right now, I'm on track to be able to, to do my outreach like this and get paid for it then do my field work, my research, do my publications, and yeah, yeah. So I, I feel like I'm in a really good place. Um, yeah, I'm really, really lucky to be able to have this opportunity. I recognize how fortunate I am. And that is thanks to the generosity and support of these wonderful people watching right now. Um, buddy, thank you so much. Yeah. This changed my life, being able to stream like this and, like, you know, actually have people watch and support me. It's incredible. It really is. And I, I think about that every day. So thank you, everybody. Um, yeah, Moosey Fate says, big congrats on it starting Thursday. Yeah! Super excited, Moosey Fate. How are you doing? It's good to see you. Uh, I'm head, head out to Jordan. I might, Rodan. I might head out to Jordan, Montana. Um, we shall see. I know I'm going to be in Ekalaka, and I'm going to be in Bozeman. Um, but yeah. Maui Girl says, I will text you and we can chat more. Excellent. Thank you. Thanks, Auntie. I really appreciate that. Uh, It's Not a Moon says, hello. Hello, It's Not a Moon. Sorry it took me so long to get to your message. Um, it's great to see you. Welcome to Paleontology. Right, I got to catch up to the bottom of the chat here. Uh... Could be meeting the, the Danny family. Maybe Rodan. We'll see how people feel. I'm going to be seeing my mom on uh, Thursday, too. I don't know if she's going to want to be on camera, but maybe I'll do a stream that day. We'll see. Um, oh, thank you, Mr. Ictian. I really appreciate that. Enjoy your burgers. I'll see you next time. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if it's a space station. It might just be... <laughs> there you go, it's not a moon. Yeah. I thought that was a Star Wars reference. Uh, and the Lenina says, I wanted to be a paleontologist when I was younger, but due to my own insecurities, I did not follow that dream. I really appreciate getting to live vicariously through you. Thank you, Lenina. That is really sweet of you to say. Um, again, just let me say, I've been really, really lucky. Um, and that I... I don't know. The life that I'm able to lead right, lead right now is... Due to the support of wonderful people like you, so thank you, Lenina. Um, and I've just been really, I don't know, to use kind of a corny phrase, I've been really blessed over the years to be able to work with people like, uh, you know, Denver Fowler, people like Pat Holroyd, um, people like Liz Friedman Fowler, people who are doing really cool things in paleontology and who let me join up with them and make really cool discoveries and contribute to the scientific process. I was just thinking about this last night. Um, I've been extraordinarily fortunate in that in a you know, pretty short career so far, I'm still a young researcher, I've been able to be a part of some really, really cool projects. And I've made some really cool discoveries myself. And like, how many people my age, at an early stage in their career, can say that they've done as much field work as I've done or, you know, been on crews that have discovered new species and genera of dinosaurs. Um, it's, it's really cool. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm grateful for that every single day. Um, and Lenina, thank you so much for your support. You know I appreciate that. Yeah. Uh, 
Uh, and Izzy says, I will never understand Grant's. You and me both, Izzy. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, we really do. You're right. Uh, so you basically, you want to be tenured. There you go, James Green. <laughs> I guess so, yeah, yeah. Uh, a non-academic Twitch tenureship. And that's, that's almost like what partnership is here on Twitch. Um, that's kind of funny. Yeah. Uh, and Moosey Fate says, I'm alright, starting a new contract around the same time you get started. Once they square away technical things? Moosey Fate, that sounds exciting. Sounds like a big change. I wish you the very best of luck. I hope you're excited about it. Um, yeah. And thank you, Claire. Yeah. Totally second what Claire said right there. Um, and Invisible Dimension says, so interesting that your line of work keeps getting compared, keeps comparing to artists, musicians, and writers. Perhaps your way of teaching through Twitch is the new way moving forward uh, with an ancient twist. <laughs> I, I don't know. Dimensions, there's... I, I honestly don't know if this would work for a lot of my colleagues. Um, again, I was just talking about this the other day, too. I've been really lucky in that my... My... Like, the course of my life has kind of... Lined me up perfectly to do this kind of thing. Um, I don't know. It, with, like, experience in you know, video editing and artwork and a little bit in um, a lot of experience in public speaking, uh, some experience in teaching, um, and just, you know, working a lot of jobs where I have to talk to people, like, in a very authentic, one-on-one -on -one kind of way, you know, in a very unpretentious way. Uh... I've been really lucky to have the kind of experiences that could set me up to do something like this. And yeah. Yeah. Not everybody has that. And I've been very lucky. And, uh... Yeah. I don't want to forget that. Linus says, my paleontologizing shirt came today. That is super exciting, Lenina. Wow. Really cool. Really cool. Yes. Um, I hope you enjoy it. Uh, hope it fits well. Hope it's comfortable. Uh, tell their children about your stream so they can learn. Thank you, Izzy. <laughs> You're so sweet, Izzy. Uh, and Belint says, You are what we scientists should strive to be. Holy cow, Belint. Especially on public engagement. You inspire me to do better. Belint, that... <sighs> you make me blush, Belint. I really appreciate your support and your enthusiasm and your, your kind words. Holy cow. Um... I'm lucky that, I don't know, I'm lucky that I enjoy this, I guess. And I'm lucky to have viewers and supporters like you, Belint. Thank you. Uh, yeah. And uh, Everest Clary says, Oh, Danny, make sure you keep yourself covered and get releases signed by anyone who might be on stream. Um, let's see. It'll help keep you out of trouble if they... Well, thank you, Everest Clary. Yeah, the only places I'm going to be streaming are going to be... Uh, like on public property so generally as I understand US law um, you know if you're on public property and you're not like putting the camera in people's faces it's generally okay but I will look into that so thank you Avarice I appreciate that yeah um, and hey there Mr. Pop and DJ how are you doing welcome back good to see you yeah and happiest colleague flatter me. Thank you so much. Welcome back, by the way. It's good to see you. Um, and Pravid Deuce says, Danny, what's up, everybody? Hey, Pravid Deuce. Welcome to Paleontologizing. It's good to have you here. Thanks for joining us. Um, and Belint says, I'm honestly trying to emulate you. I'm trying to make a book, a kid's book about ants and epigenetics. When folks heard, they told me to knock it off. And if I have a hobby, I'm not working enough, so I'm doing it even more so. Bullhint, that is exactly the right approach. Holy cow. So, I mean, here. Everybody, I know sometimes I... I gripe a little bit about academia and how... Sometimes the priorities aren't really right there. Um, holy cow, freckled science! 
Thank you for the raid, freckled science. Welcome to paleontologizing, everybody. <laughs> I need to fix up that raid notification. That's, uh... This is Laura Dern at Jurassic Park. Digging up dinosaurs is Thank hard, you for the follow there. work. It I'm takes happy. months or years, so leave it to the yeah. professionals. Um, but yeah, I don't know, Belint, that's really awesome that you're, you're working on science outreach and you're... We fight with monsters. We came here to find fossils. <laughs> These notifications are a little distracting. They're new, everybody. But yeah, Belint, that's, that's wonderful. I'm, I'm excited to hear more about this. And uh, you let me know when some of your stuff comes out so I can support you. Um, Solid Gray Fox, how are you doing? Welcome. And, uh, let's see. Amanda went to feed her dog, but she didn't say to greet you. Uh, well, hello, talk programmer. Welcome to Paleontologizing. <laughs> Raiders, how's everybody doing? Welcome to Paleontologizing. Trachodon, 32 feet long and 14 feet high. dead peeps. 1,500 Thank you for the follow. And not a single cavity. <laughs> I'm loving these new, notif new notifications. They were a lot of work to do, but they're, uh, I think they're fun. Um, yeah. And Izzy says, Danny, I am blessed to have found you. I talk about what I learned from you to my friends. That's so awesome, Izzy. Thank you for telling me that. That warms my heart. It really does. And it's so great to have you here in this community. Um, really appreciate you. Uh, that was loud? Sorry. <laughs> I could turn that down a little bit. Um, there we go. Yeah. Really spectacular. Spared no expense. Chili Foxy. Chili Foxy gifted Solid X Gray Fox a subscription. Really Chili appreciate Foxy that. Chili gifted a tier one sub to Solid X Gray Fox. They have given two gift subs in the channel. Thank you so much, Chili Foxy. It means a lot to me. From one fox to another, it seems. Uh, from Fox to Fox. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> um. It seems we've got some new people here. Can you give me maybe a one in chat if you're here from uh, Amanda's stream? Uh, I want to know if I should play a welcome video real quick for everybody. Or if we should just continue on with this. Claire, you were here before. <laughs> uh, but yeah, Invisible Dimensions. What do you mean Internet Archive for those clips? Um, okay, we're having some ones already. You were in Amanda's stream when she raided? Is that right, Claire? Did she raid and then unraid, or did she host, or... The notification wasn't clear about that. That might be because I don't have them set up properly yet. Um... Alright, oh, Sprock says one? Alright. Well, if Sprock, who's a first-time chatter, says one, then one it shall be. Uh... We'll go ahead and pause our tunes. I'm gonna introduce you to somebody whom we like to call Previously Recorded Danny, and he's going to, uh... I'm going to tell you a little bit about who I am, how I came to be here, what this channel's all about. So without further ado, let's bring him on. Here he comes now. All right, previously recorded, Danny. Go ahead and take it away. Well, thanks for present day, Danny. Well, if you happen to be new around here, then welcome to Paleontologizing. You may well be wondering to yourself, uh, well, if this is Twitch, then where are the video games? I'm going to level with you here. I don't really do much in the way of video games. I'm a paleontologist. My name is Danny Anduza, and dinosaurs are my area of study. But how in the world does a paleontologist end up on Twitch? Well, you're about to find out. When I finished high school, I moved to Montana and immediately started work at the Museum of the Rockies, which at the time was unparalleled powerhouse of paleobiology. That program was built by this guy. Famed paleontologist Alan Grant. Well, kind of. You consulted on that movie. I did consult on the, all and those movies. And they said the, the guy Alan Grant was you. <laughs> yes. Yeah, well, fortunately he didn't get eaten. <laughs> <laughs> Meet Jack Horner, the real-life Alan Grant. He's one of the most prominent and controversial paleontologists in the country. A dyslexic MacArthur Foundation genius who never finished college and who says he doesn't care why dinosaurs went extinct. To him, the important part is how they lived. It was at Museum of the Rockies, under the auspects of Jack Horner, that I learned how to be a dinosaur paleontologist. 
and a huge part of that I learned by working with Jack's final graduate student, a guy by the name of Denver Fowler, who would later go on to become curator of the Badlands Dinosaur Museum. Working with Denver, I did summer after summer of fieldwork in the remote Badlands of Montana. Together, we dug up more dinosaurs than we knew what to do with, at fossil sites numbering in the hundreds. In 2012, I discovered a new species of ceratopsian dinosaur, hopefully soon to be published. The next year, we excavated the world's smallest and youngest Tyrannosaurus rex. Then, we dug up a brand new ankylosaur. Montana's news leader. Five paleontologists are excavating what looks to likely be a new species of armored dinosaur. So we found its head, and we found parts of its armor and plates, and so it, it should be a new species. Not bad, right? Well, anyway, much like my fieldwork, my research also focuses on dinosaurs. For example, here's Trierarchonchus, the last of the alvarosaurs, just published in July of 2020. One of my current projects focuses on spinosaurids. I can't really talk too much about that until it's a little bit closer to publication, so uh, stay tuned for that. Anyway, let's get back to how I ended up on Twitch. A couple years ago, things in Montana were declining rapidly. So I picked up and moved on to greener pastures. I'm so glad I did. And with that new perspective, I also realized that I have very little patience with the soul-crushing bureaucracy within academia. For the time being, anyway, I decided to take my career in a slightly different direction. I got hired for a job in early childhood education. As a teacher, I get to have a positive impact on kids' lives, to help them find a passion for science. Then, when COVID-19 showed up, the school had to close. But that didn't stop the teaching or the learning. We just moved online. All right, friends. So, we're going to be looking at a book in a little bit, but I thought we'd start off with a song. At three, two, two. one. <laughs> oh, give me a home where the hadrosaurs roamed, where triceratops bellowed and grazed, where erosion uncovers bones we seek to discover for to strike the whole world amazing. It was a pretty easy jump from teaching online to streaming on Twitch. I had my first broadcast in May, and I've been on here ever since. Now I believe pretty strongly that any good scientist should also be a public servant. In my opinion, talking to everyday people about her science is one of the most important things that a researcher can do. I now have a golden opportunity to reach out directly to people where they are. This is what I'm all about, and now thanks to Twitch, I get to share it with you, and I'm so happy to be able to do so. It's my intention to continue this mission of education by answering your questions, providing good science content, and working to grow this channel. And if you could help by following, or if you could afford it, by subscribing, I would be deeply grateful. So anyway, to my regular viewers, thank you again for sitting through this. And to everybody who's new, welcome. Genuinely, earnestly glad that you're here. I hope you stick around. We've got a remarkable little community here, and uh, be delighted if you join us. Anyway, uh, let's go ahead and get back into it. So, uh, present day Danny, back to you. Well, thank you very much, previously recorded Danny. And uh, thank you again to Freckled Science for the raid. Thank you so much, Amanda. I really appreciate that. Um... Yeah, everybody, how was Amanda's stream? I hope it was really good. And, uh, yeah, can we get another shout-out for Freckled Science real quick? I'd appreciate that. Um, 
So yeah, yeah. Let me tell you something that previously recorded Danny couldn't have known at the time that he was being recorded. It's that I'm going to be leaving this summer on a great big trip around the American West, and I'm going to be live streaming it. Um, so that's going to include museum trips, kind of random on-the-road stuff, also visiting some field sites, and maybe, if we're lucky, even some paleontological field work, too. We'll have to see. Yeah. Uh, anyway, I'm very, very excited for that. It's going to be really cool. I tested out some more of my mobile live streaming gear on Friday, so you can check out the VOD from that. Um, this is a really complicated setup with, like, a whole bunch of different parts. How high? Thank you for the follow. I appreciate that. Welcome to Paleontologizer. Also, Venatorius Albus, thank you for the follow during the video. And, uh, yeah. And Sees Dead Peeps, thank you for the follow, too. Anyway, yeah. Uh, really excited about this trip. It's going to be really, really cool. Uh, it's not going to be cheap, too, for all of the, uh... I had to get an unlimited data plan um, for, like, I think four different mobile networks. So it's pretty pricey. That's what that sub goal is for there at the bottom. So if you were wondering about that, that's what it is. Um, so yeah, yeah, anywho. Uh, and Pride Gaming Media, how are you doing, PGM? Welcome to Paleontologizing. I've seen you in Lordy's channel. Welcome to my channel. Yeah, says, so hello, sir, how are you doing? I'm on break putting from putting together a roller coaster right now. Wow, sounds like a big job. Getting ready to put a Ferris wheel together, an IRL for the Delaware State Fair. Oh, very cool, very cool, PGM. You be careful. I know you are, I'm sure you are. Um, that sounds really awesome. And I'm glad you could take a break and, uh, and tune in for a little bit. Uh, so Pride Gaming Media, I know that you've seen Lordy's streams before. Um, if I don't end up doing field work this summer, Lordy is actually going to be accompanying me on a great big road trip across the American West, visiting different museums and doing all kinds of cool stuff. Just look at that thing. It's not going to be friendly to us. <laughs> Zest the Squatch, thank you for the five months of support. I really appreciate that. Welcome back to Paleontologizing Sass. It's great to have you here. Um, yeah, anyway, Pride Gaming Media. So if you want more Lordy content, uh, I hope to, uh, to see you in chat then. Because uh, Lordy's going to be accompanying me, potentially, on a trip across the country. It's going to be really neat. So, yeah. Uh, and Aditya, I do have new alerts. This is true. Uh, very observant of you, Aditya. <laughs> Hope you're doing well. Good to see you. Uh, and Milady Rebecca, how are you? Welcome back to Paleontologizer. Yeah. Uh, Carnivorous and Patasaur. I know, right, Mayor Space? <laughs> uh, some classic... I think Ray Harryhausen animation. Uh, but yeah. And... Which is says, I enjoy the illusion of being involved in cooking without having to do anything. That's a lot of fun, Winger, yeah. It's even better when you get to eat the food. Which I've been very lucky to be able to do. Hey, Mikey Likes, how are you doing? Good to see you. Hope all is well. Um, yeah. And Solid Gray Fox? Your state dinosaur is Hadrosaurus. You must live in New Jersey, then. Yeah. Hadrosaurus is one of the first dinosaurs to be described from North America. Um, from, uh, from Haddonfield, New Jersey. That's not why it's called Hadrosaurus. Hadrosaurus just means large lizard, if I remember correctly. Hadro means big or large. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, yeah, there we go. New Jersey. I knew it. Um, yeah, I like the good... Yeah, Lenina. I'm a big Godzilla fan myself, so that's... Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Anywho, everybody. We've got a lot of cool fossil news to go over for today. Almost a fossil news overload. So, let's see if we can get to some of it. Um, let's see... Here we go. First off here, we've got a new dinosaur discovery in the great nation of Mongolia, one of the best places in the entire world 
to find dinosaurs. I'm just seeing this for the first time right now. This is totally blind. But I wonder, I wonder if this is going to help consolidate some of the Oviraptorosaurs from Mongolia. Let me show you what these creatures look like, Oviraptorosaurs. Uh, Oviraptor is probably the most well-known of all of them. But they are very, very bird-like dinosaurs from the Cretaceous period. Uh, this is... This is Scenignathus, or... Uh, who is this guy? That might be Ingenia. Uh, oh, no, that might be uh, Numingia, the one with the pygostyle style on the tail. Anyway, these have been colorfully termed uh, chickens from hell, the Oviraptorosaurus. They are really cool animals. Here's one. I think this is Anzu from the Hell Creek Formation. Really, really cool critters. Uh, if you happen to be into dinosaurs in the 1990s, then uh, or 1980s too, you've probably seen these guys before in illustrations like cracking open other dinosaurs' eggs and, and eating them. The word Oviraptor literally means egg thief because that was originally our hypothesis for what they did, how they made their living, was like eating other dinosaurs' eggs, among other things. As it turns out, these guys weren't egg thieves, as far as we know. Uh, they were very caring parents, as you can see in this picture right here. I'm interested in your island. It's got nothing uh, to do with oil. I'm a paleontologist. Well, so you're not even a good lion. Greta Disciples, thank you for the follow. I appreciate that. Welcome to Paleontologizing. Yeah. Uh... But yeah, yeah, anyway. Oviraptorosaurs, really, really cool dinosaurs. Um, they're very well known from Mongolia, and we have a few of them from North America now, too, including one in the Hell Creek Formation. Uh, actually, more than one in the Hell Creek Formation. So, yeah, really cool critters, but I have been... Thank you, Mike Starr, for that follow. I appreciate it. <laughs> uh, welcome to Paleontologizing. I've been of the opinion for a long time that these guys are grossly oversplit. Especially in Mongolia. By oversplit, I mean that there have been way more of them named than there are actually different dinosaurs. Like, a lot of the different Oviraptorosaurs that have been named, I think are probably either ontogeomorphs of the same animal, so like the, the same animal at different growth stages. Because the dinosaurs change a lot as they grow and mature, to the point where sometimes a young one is described as a totally different genus or species from an adult one. It could be that, or it could also be, on top of that, uh, like, chronological uh, variations. Like, these are lineages of animals that are evolving over time. So if you find one from, say, a million years after another one, it might look a little bit different, because everything is constantly changing. So whether or not you call that a different species, it becomes kind of arbitrary, if it's still within the same lineage, if there wasn't a splitting event. But anyway, the point is... I've thought for a long time, and a lot of other paleontologists have thought for a long time, that over Aptorosaurs, there's, there's kind of a false sense of diversity there. There aren't really that many species or that many genera. I'm thinking maybe this paper might speak to that a little bit. Um, yeah. Uh, a very cool Mikey likes. Good to hear about the garden. Uh, Mighty Rancho, how are you doing? I feel like it's been a long time. I'm shaking, Mighty Rancho. Good to see ya. Yeah. And let's see. Uh, before we get to this paper, let me catch up to chat real quick. Iverse Clary says, So, Danny, how do you feel about people calling not dinosaurs dinosaurs? E.g. Rhynchosaurus? Yeah, Iverse Clary, it... Most people don't know better. That's the thing. What do I feel when most people do that? I feel like... We didn't come here to fight with monsters. We came here to find fossils. Thank you, uh, young game changer for the follow. When somebody points to a plesiosaur, or a pterosaur, or a rhynchosaur, and they say, oh, dinosaur, what do I feel about that? I feel like I need to do a better job of informing them what a dinosaur is. You know, it's my job as a paleontologist. Um, yeah. And that's part of what I'm doing here on this stream. Or on this channel, I mean. We'll maybe get into that a little bit later if you want to. Uh, but we'll see if we can get through some of this fossil news. Um, and is he the new Ankylosaurid? I did hear about that. Yeah, that's pretty cool stuff. We might talk about that later, too. 
Uh, and very cool, Anita. Your husband and you will watch Gojira movies and eat cheesecake every year on your anniversary? That sounds like a solid relationship. Uh, that's very romantic. Well, pretty cool. <laughs> um, yeah. He spelled over after it right the first time. I, I try, James. I try. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Gotta go mod some goats. Have fun, Andy. You're probably already gone. Thank you for popping in. It's good to see you. Um, and let's see. And Mr. Spock says, how many different dogs do we have in 30,000 years? And in a million years, there should be a lot of diversity. Yes and no. I mean, that's the thing is that the dogs haven't speciated. They haven't... They haven't become different species. They're still capable of reproduction um, with other breeds of dog. But the thing is, if you did have different breeds of dog and they never interbred for thousands upon thousands of years, eventually you would get new species. They would speciate. You know, they would split and become different species. And of course, this whole thing is a little bit arbitrary. What we consider different species and what we don't. Nature doesn't necessarily fit into these neat little boxes that we try and put it into. But dogs so far are all the same species. Canis familiar, Canis familiar, familiaris, familiaris. I don't know if I've ever said that out loud before. Canis familiaris. But yeah, the domestic dog. They haven't speciated yet, but they could in the future if current trends continue. You know. Um. But yeah. Uh, and Pragmatic Entropy, you have enough points for a... Oh, a Dinosaur Deep Dive? Awesome. Very cool. Yeah. Solid Gray Fox says, by the way, I have a PDF on my phone about a dinosaur encyclopedia. Um, cool, Solid Gray. That sounds neat. Yeah. Uh, and Young Game Changer says, hello, I have a question. That sounds more like a statement, Young Game Changer. I'm just kidding. What's your question? I want to hear it, and I want to answer it for you. Um, yeah. Spina Breakers is explaining stooping and why Overaptor is, Overaptors were mis misclassified is always fun. What do you mean, Spina Breaker? Do you mean brooding? Like, sitting on top of the nests? Yeah. Stooping is what Peregrine Falcons do. By the way, I saw a Peregrine Falcon just outside my apartment today and it was so cool it was just sitting on a telephone line like right outside my window is really awesome i'll show you a picture if you want to see one in a minute remind me uh oh and spina breaker says i mean what they mean is from a fossil perspective dogs would look like different species they would spina breaker this is true yeah this is this is actually really true here i can show you a, an example of like a uh, let's find a bulldog skull. Do you think dinosaurs um. are put together correctly? The bones. <laughs> You're smart. Very what do you question. think? Do a research I, on that, I, Oliver. I, I never. I fight for them. Thank you for the a follow. I appreciate that. Kid. With six-inch daggers for teeth, he was the terror of his neighborhood. Thank you for the follow. I appreciate both of you. Thank you so much. Welcome to Paleontologizer. Let's check out some bulldog skulls, just to hammer home this point about uh, how different dogs, you know, how different they can look. Check that out. That is a an American, no, English bulldog skull, excuse me. Look at that pronathus. Just look at that extreme underbite. That is nuts. And here is a bulldog skull compared to, well, I don't know. That might be like a... On the left, sorry, left would be in that direction for you guys. On the left side, I think that is a bulldog from a long time ago, and on the right side is a bulldog from fairly recently, like a modern bulldog. Let's compare that to, say, a... maybe a whippet, or a greyhound. Um, look how different that is. Um, or maybe like a saluki. Uh, yeah, not that different, actually. But yeah. Anyway. Artificial breeding like that, it just kind of takes evolution. It takes the... 
the natural variations that occur in a population of organisms, and it just supercharges them. I mean, you can get supercharged evolution through selective breeding like that, which is nuts. Um, that was one of the things that Charles Darwin, uh, that was one of his insights early on, is that the same processes that allow people to create different breeds of dogs, like those can occur in nature to get creatures to speciate and evolve in different directions and have wildly different forms and appearances. So yeah. Um, yeah. Uh -huh. And Zelix says, I'm lurking, but I'm wondering if many bird species can live in the same environment, what makes you think it is different from Mongolian raptors? Oh, like oviraptorosaurs? Or dromaeosaurs too? I think it's a great question. And it this is kind of at the heart of dinosaur paleontology. I was like, how do you actually spot different populations of animals, different species in the fossil record? How do you tell that they're different from one another if you only have their bones to look at? And it gets tricky. But the thing is, the fossil record is pretty incomplete in the sense that we don't really have a whole lot of different places where like the environments are super well preserved so like you could look at the hell creek formation in north america at the very end of the cretaceous or the dejacta formation of mongolia in the late cretaceous and these you find lots and lots of fossils there there's fossils everywhere and it might represent the fauna relatively well it might be like a relatively complete picture of you know the animals that were alive at the time especially if you collect it properly and you do a really good job and are very thorough about it. But you're not going to find very many formations like that all around the world. Usually, due to a lot of different things, you only have like a few vertebrate fossils from any given geologic formation because it's not exposed in enough places. Maybe it wasn't a great depositional environment. Um, so yeah, I think there is a lot of diversity um, of dinosaurs throughout the Mesozoic, but I think we're looking for it in the wrong place sometimes. If you're looking for lots and lots of different species in the same environment, you know, that might not be the case. With birds, or with insects, or with small mammals and stuff like that, you might have a lot of different species all sharing the same place because those animals are small. And generally, like, the smaller you are, the more species you can have coexisting in a small geographic area. The larger you get, kind of the less diverse you get. And think about in Africa. Think about the whole continent of Africa today. And how many different species of mammal live there? What do you think would be the most species group? Which group do you think would have the most species? Is it going to be something like shrews or, you know, rodents or something like that? So, or some sort of small animal? Dinosaurs became extinct because they no longer knew how to love each other. That's correct. Why is the text not coming through there? Exactly. There we go. Certainly wouldn't want our species to end the same way. Hi <laughs> all. Cheap shot. Thank you for the 10 months. Holy cow. I really appreciate that. Thank you very much. Um yeah, yeah. Anyway, uh, we're talking about species diversity in modern Africa. Are you going to have more species of shrew? Or are you going to have more species of elephant? Generally, the larger you are, the more area you have to cover in order to kind of make your daily rounds and get enough food. Um, yeah, like, the, the fewer of you uh, a given area can support, the larger you are. Dinosaurs, a lot of them got really big. And I don't think it's... I think the larger a dinosaur is, the less likely it is that uh, it's got a lot of closely related animals, closely related dinosaurs, species close to it, living in the same vicinity. Um, yeah, does that make sense? I hope it does. I'm spending way too long talking about this. We'll get into the paper and we'll talk about it a little bit more. Um, yeah. Mm hmm and let's see, Pengoline, 
Hey! How are you doing, Pangolin? Welcome to Paleontologizing. Yeah. Anyway, the point is, basically, dinosaurs are very much like modern birds in a lot of different ways, but species diversity doesn't seem to be one of those ways. I feel like, and I've said this before, the arc of dinosaur taxonomy is long, but it bends toward consolidation. Generally, I think most dinosaur genera have been oversplit. And it's like the more that we learn about dinosaur life history and biology, the more it turns out that these things that we, we used to think were different species or different genera, they're actually either the same individual animals like evolving, changing through ontogeny. So like the same creature might look very different at different growth stages. Pachycephalosaurus is a great example of this. Uh, or it's just stratigraphic variation, which is something that modern biologists never have to think about. Because with modern biologists, you know, just looking at animals that are alive today, you don't have to think about, like, if you go out and catch a butterfly in a net, and then you go out and collect another butterfly, the same net, you don't have to worry about, like, oh, is this one actually a million years older than this one? And, you know, it may have evolved into this one? It's like, no, if they look different, if they're very different from one another, chances are they are different species. Um... But in the fossil record, it gets a little bit more blurry. There's like a different axis. We have like a Y axis in the fossil record, and that's time. And so it just becomes a lot more complicated when trying to classify living things. And if you don't have good stratigraphic data, if you have a, a dinosaur that you've dug up and you don't know exactly how old it is, either you didn't take great data when you were in the field to figure out where exactly it came from in the rock layer, or you don't have proper dates for it, you don't know how to compare it to the age of other dinosaurs found nearby or in other parts of the world. Well, then it's going to be really difficult to place that animal in time. And so it could be really difficult to say if it's the same or different from something else because you don't know if they if they line up in time. So, yeah, it gets complicated. We'll take a look at this paper, though. Uh, luckily, this is in the journal PLOS One. Normally, I don't really care what journals things get published in. You know, I feel like people make too big a deal out of that kind of thing. You know, it's all good. Publishing is publishing. But PLOS One happens to have a wonderfully charming thing about it. It is a, an open access journal, which means that... Thank you, Interstellar Feeling. <laughs> Welcome to Paleontologizer. Uh... That means, oops, that anybody can access this. So it is not paywalled. Anybody with an internet connection can read this article. And so I just put a link in chat for you. We're going to go ahead and take a look. Uh, so again, we're talking about oviraptorosaurs here. These are these really cool beaky dinosaurs. They're very bird-like, covered in feathers. I think they've been grossly oversplit in Mongolia. That's a long suspicion that I've had. We'll see if this paper speaks to them. So, we're going to take a look at the abstract here, which is like a kind of a summary of the paper. And it says the Namekt formation of the Gobi Desert of Mongolia has produced one of the most abundant and diverse oviraptorosaur records globally. However, the Cenignathid component of this fauna remains poorly known. Two Cenignathid taxa are currently recognized from the Namekt formation. So Cenignathids are a particular group of oviraptorosaurs, just to give you some background. Um, uh, Cenignathus looks like this. Um, oh, there we go. There's Cenignathid Day right there. All of these different creatures that have all been named based on pretty fragmentary material for the most part. Um, yeah. In fact, let's take a closer look at this figure. Um, yeah, Numingia. This one is from Mongolia. Uh, Elmasaurus is also from Mongolia. I think Harpy Griffiths is too. Um, and these three, I think, are from Canada. Uh, this one's from Montana. Yeah. Or maybe South Dakota. Anyway, from North America. These guys are not particularly well known in terms of their skeletons. And so sometimes you might even have non-overlapping parts. Um, 
So, like, if you're trying to tell the difference between Elmasaurus and Epicyristenodes, well, you don't have overlapping pieces that you can compare between them. And so they could even be potentially the same animal, and you wouldn't know it. Particularly if they live at the same time. Um, yeah, you could be looking at the same animal and not be sure. Elmasaurus comes from Mongolia. Epicyristenodes comes from uh, Canada, I think. And so it's very unlikely that these are actually the same exact animal, but maybe they're part of the same genus. I don't know. It's it's tricky. Um, so yeah, where did that go? There we go. So those are Cynignathids. Uh, two Cynignathid taxa are currently recognized from the Nomec formation. Elmosaurus rarus and Nomingia gobiensis. Those are those two that we just saw right here. Uh, Nomingia gobiensis which is known from most of a postcranium there, including that really short tail, which is super cool. And Elmasaurus. And these, it appears, are non-overlapping. See how... Here, let me... Uh... There we go. Uh, look at Elmasaurus here, this one in the center of the screen. See what has a hand? And it has parts of both feet? That's all that we have from Elmasaurus. We'll go up to Nomingia up here. We have vertebrae. We have a hips. We have hind limbs. We have a tail. But no feet, no hands. So it could very well be this critter right here is the same one as this one right here. And I'm guessing that's probably uh, what this article is going to say. Uh, because these taxa are known from mostly non-overlapping material, there are concerns that they could represent the same animal. Partial weathered Cynignathid skeleton discovered adjacent to the holotype quarry of Nomingia gobiensis as referable to Elmasaurus rarus, revealing more of the morphology of the cranium, mandible, pectoral girdle, and pubis. Despite metatarsals clearly exhibiting a tapomorphies of Elmasaurus rarus, overlapping elements are identical to those of Nomingia gobiensis, and add to a growing body of evidence that these taxa represent a single morphotype. Kapow! There we go. Single morphotype means that basically, like, they look the same. Morphotype just means this is like the general form of the animal. Uh, so yeah, yeah. In the absence of any positive evidence for two synonymous taxa in the Nemect formation, Nomingia gobiensis is best regarded as a junior synonym of Elmasaurus rarus. What is a junior synonym? That just means that it was a creature, a name that was named after something else. So like, Say somebody finds a dinosaur. Uh, Brontosaurus is a good example for this. Back in the 1870s, there was a paleontologist who uh, who published on some long neck dinosaur bits from uh, the American West. He named those bits Apatosaurus. Later, his crews bought him some more pieces of a long neck dinosaur. He named those pieces Brontosaurus. It turns out those seem to be the same animal. So since Brontosaurus was named second, that is the junior synonym. And the unfortunate thing about junior synonyms is you got to give them the boot. you got to get rid of them. Um, that's just what the rules say. The rules of zoological nomenclature. The rules that govern what we call living things in the sciences. Or animals in the sciences, at least, for zoological nomenclature. Uh, so yeah... In this case, Nomingia would be given the boot, and Elmasaurus would be the name that sticks. Um, so why is this important? I'll tell you in a minute. Uh, Low-seedignated diversity in the Nemect formation may reflect broader coexistence patterns with other oviraptorosaur families, particularly oviraptorids. In contrast to North America, competition with the exceptionally diverse oviraptorids may have restricted seedignathids to marginal roles in late Cretaceous Asian ecosystems. That's funny. So this is basically describing the importance of the work here. It turns out that two of these animals are probably the same thing. They think that's because they're just being outcompeted by oviraptorids, which are also super diverse. It doesn't seem like they're considering the possibility that oviraptorids might also be oversplit. But I don't know. We should look at the rest of the paper and see what they say. Uh, and here, let me switch to a different view so you can see a little bit better. There we go. Scoot this to the side. Uh -huh. 
let's see, a diverse assemblage of Alvarasaurids, Dromaeosaurids, Renathomimids, and Overaptorosaurids, there isn't a sort of Troodontids. I think all of these groups are really oversplit. It's been a big mystery for a long time, like, why are theropod dinosaurs? The two-legged, mostly meat-eating dinosaurs. Why are they so diverse in the Cretaceous of Mongolia? I don't necessarily think they were. I think a lot of that is probably oversplitting. Um... Yeah. Anyway, uh, let's scoot on down through here. There's the fossil site there. Pretty neat. Look at that. Just beautiful territory for digging up dinosaurs. I mean, holy cow. That is gorgeous. Wow. This is why Mongolia is one of the best places in the world to find dinosaurs. Because you have this much exposed rock from the age of dinosaurs there. I mean... Holy cow, take a look at that. It's just... It's like no plants for miles and miles around. No parking lots, no cities, nothing to obstruct your, your view of these beautiful, tasty, sedimentary rocks from which you can find vertebrate fossils. Um, pretty awesome. Anyway, uh... Here are some bits of the critter. There's some more there. It's like a scap coracoid. Shoulder blade and uh, coracoid bone. And that looks like a pubis right there. Yeah. Uh, one of the hip bones. What's that? It's like maybe one of the ankle bones or something like that. Uh, metatarsals. Yeah, anyway. So this is really cool. This is good scientific detective work. Um, because using... You know how on this channel I often say, like, we don't know something yet, we need to go out and find more fossils? I know I say that a lot. I feel like I say that almost every broadcast. This is a perfect example of that taking place. And new fossils helping to solve kind of a mystery that's been going on for a long time. Pretty neat stuff. I mean, this is the way paleontology is supposed to work. Uh, so it's pretty awesome to see. Uh, anyway, relationships of Elmasaurus. Yeah. So, I wonder... I wonder whether this has become, like, official yet. Um, this is what... At uh, at Museum of the Rockies, what we used to call sinking a dinosaur. Um, a dinosaur taxon, a dinosaur genus or species, gets sunk when it turns out that it's actually the same thing as something else. Uh, sunk just means like we don't, we're not going to use that name anymore. You know, it's not its own thing anymore. It's the same thing as something else that we know about. I wonder if Wikipedia reflects this yet. I wonder if anybody has has uh, updated Wikipedia. Uh, to reflect these, this new publication. Numingia, there we go. So this is the one that we were talking about um, that was named second. This would be the junior synonym, like we were saying. I think you should enjoy science as much as you can. And you can't enjoy science alone. You have to share it. Thank you, Sentient. Thank you so much for enjoying science. With all, with all of us. Welcome back to Paleontologizing. Thank you for the two months of support. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, yeah. All right. Uh, interesting. It hasn't been updated yet. This is kind of surprising. Normally with Dinosaur Wikipedia, it is updated like that. But that's the thing. There is a bias that you gotta be careful of, this kind of thing, especially with Wikipedia. It is as follows. The people who update Wikipedia, you know, they're working for free, and they're updating Wikipedia because they're interested in fossils, you know. If you're updating a Wikipedia dinosaur page, it means that you're, you know, you really like dinosaurs, and you wanna help spread that knowledge to the public. Um, most paleontologists don't really have enough time to update Wikipedia. 
They don't have enough leisure time to be able to do that kind of thing. Um, so it's like interested amateurs who do that. But the thing about interested amateurs is that they tend to like dinosaurs a lot. And there's nothing wrong with that, obviously. But the thing is, when you like dinosaurs a lot, you kind of want there to be as many dinosaurs as possible. You might have a slight bias toward oversplitting. Because everybody likes to hear about new dinosaurs. You know, you want to be able to memorize these different dinosaurs and rattle them off. It's just, it's fun to have more dinosaurs. Unfortunately, that doesn't always reflect reality. And in a case like this, um, I'm guessing that the editors of Wikipedia might be a little bit reticent to get rid of the Min Nomingia article or even say in the article that, hey, this is probably the same thing as Elmasaurus. So, yeah. And this bias also extends to dinosaur paleontologists, too. Um, there's kind of an eternal battle going on. Not just in dinosaur paleontology, but in all branches of, you know, uh, organismal taxonomy. Like, naming and classifying living things. This eternal battle is between people who get termed lumpers and splitters. Lumpers are people who, you know, when they look at a group of living things, they're more apt to see the similarities between them. They're less likely to think, hey, these are different species or whatever. They're like, no, they're, they're probably the same thing. You know, I'm gonna lump them together. Splitters are people who notice the differences more, and they want to split things up. I think that there's been a big bias towards splitting in dinosaur paleontology. And there are a lot of reasons for that. People like to name dinosaurs. Everybody wants there to be more dinosaurs. It's totally understandable. We're dealing with usually a very incomplete fossil record. We all knew. If it hadn't been for that great dinosaur... Thank you, David and the American forces, we would all be dead. Uh... Uh, Danny, your display looks fantastic behind you with that lighting. Thanks, David Accounter. Also, how is the live field streams going? I saw hey. major forest fires across several states on the news in Montana. Yeah. With one shocked face. Hope you're safe. I am safe, David Accounting. I'm still in Oakland, California right now. I will be leaving to go all across the American West on Thursday. So I'm really looking forward to that. Um, I'm going to try and avoid the forest fires as best I can. Uh... David Accounting, you, you're from the UK, right? Uh, the American West is a huge place. So even if there are wildfires raging all around the American West, I might not even see one for the entire summer. Um, but yeah, yeah, I don't know. I appreciate the well wishes very much. I appreciate your ongoing support. Thank you so much, David Accounting, for those 10 months. Holy cow. I appreciate your kind words about the setup and everything. And, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, really looking forward to being able to share this trip with you uh, in just a little bit. Just a few days, I'm leaving. Holy moly. So, yeah. And thank you for commenting on the, the setup, too. Um, I think it's looking pretty snazzy. I finally finished assembling the whole juvenile Tyrannosaurus skeleton. <laughs> <laughs> Freelancer117, thank you for the follow. I appreciate that. Um, yeah, yeah. I finally finished assembling the juvenile Tyrannosaurus, so I think it's... I'm pretty proud of it. It's looking pretty good. Um, so, yeah. Anyway, uh, let's continue to talk for just a minute about this. Yeah, I I don't know. There's kind of a, an eternal battle between lumpers and splitters. It's just kind of two different philosophies about how to classify organisms. You can take a guess uh, which camp I might fall into more broadly. Um, let me know in chat what you think. And I'll catch up to chat. But yeah. Uh, I am way late in chat. Holy cow. Catch up. Uh, let's see here. Uh... And James Gurney says, so increased body size should correlate with habitat generalist. I suppose so, James, yeah. That's a good way of putting it, much more succinctly than I did. Um, yeah, you just need a lot more resources when, you're, when you've got a larger body size. And so there might not be as many niches available to critters your size if, uh, 
if you're really big. Yeah. Um, and let's see. <laughs> and thanks, Zomboctopus. I appreciate the follow. Welcome to Paleontology. Yeah. James says plus one is fine. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I. I don't like to rank journals in terms of prestige or anything, especially in dinosaur paleontology. Nature and Science publish a lot of garbage. Like, they're kind of tabloids when it comes to a lot of stuff. So, I don't know. I, I'll never I'll never begrudge anybody for publishing in a smaller journal. Um, but yeah. Uh, Sniper Schnitzel says, How come you not outside getting dirty at summer? Very soon, Sniper Schnitzel. Very soon. Yeah. Uh, and it's big C, says, I've always wondered when it comes to museum exhibits, were all the dinosaurs real, even behind the glass cases? Um, sometimes they're real and sometimes they're cast. You should read the, usually the plaques should tell you. The information on the displays should include whether it is a real genuine fossil or a cast. I'd say most of the time it's a cast, just because real fossils are heavy, they're delicate, they're difficult to mount properly without damaging them. And we like to generally keep them down in the collections so that they can be studied and protected. At the same time, I think it's important to show the public real dinosaur fossils. Um, so sometimes you do see that, yeah. We can talk for a little bit about which ones are... How to tell the difference between a cast and an actual genuine fossil. Uh, but that's something we will be discussing a lot in the coming weeks as I do some museum streams as I'm going to be visiting different museums across the American West uh, and doing IRL mobile live streaming. And, uh, yeah, I can kind of train you on how to spot the difference. It's going to be, it's going to be a lot of fun. Um, yeah. And thank you, Claire, for helping clarify that. Yes. Uh, yeah. Oh, and uh, Pragmatic Entropy claims Stegosaurus and the Thagomizer... All right, Claire, thank you for that. Let me update that real quick. Um, there we go. We had a dinosaur deep dive request. Um, we're getting way up there. Stegosaurus, we already have Stegosaurus, but we can focus on the Thagomizer. Um, focus on Thagomizer for Pragmatic Entropy, right? Alright, thank you, Pragmatic Entropy. We will get to that when we do a Dinosaur Deep Dive. That's gonna be fun. That's gonna be a lot of fun. Uh, but yeah, anyway. Uh, and let's see. Sierra Loves Nature, how are you doing? Good to see you. It says, what is the correlation between sedimentary rocks and vertebrates? No, it's just sedimentary rocks and fossils. Yeah. As you may have learned in school, there's, broadly speaking, three different types of rocks. Igneous rocks, which come from volcanic activity, like lava cooling and, this, and stuff like that. Like, lava rocks are kind of igneous rock. There's metamorphic rock, which happens when the two other types of rock uh, get deformed or changed by heat or pressure. And then there's sedimentary rocks. Those are layered rocks that are formed by the deposition of sediments over time. So sandstone, mudstone, siltstone, shale, limestone, those are all sedimentary rocks. And those are the rocks that we find fossils in. Because those are the rocks that form when we have stuff that gets buried. You have sediment that gets buried over time. That's what forms sedimentary rocks. Occasionally, a sedimentary rock that contains some fossils will get metamorphosed and turned into a metamorphic rock, but it's pretty rare. And usually that messes up the fossils to the point where you can't really study them. And if uh, igneous rock, if sedimentary rocks containing fossils get melted and turned into magma, then, well, then the fossils are gone. So that's why we don't find fossils in igneous sediment for the most part. And usually not metamorphic rocks either. Uh, did I say igneous sediment? <laughs> it's like, that's almost an oxymoron. But yeah, anyway, I hope that makes sense. Fossils come from sedimentary rocks because fossils are buried things. And sedimentary rocks form when, you know, layers compact and bury stuff. 
So yeah. Uh, and let's see. And it wasn't Robin Williams in the notifications now, is he? Which which notification? Um, and Monster on Twitch says, "Do you have a brother? You look like a gaming YouTuber." Lol. I do have a brother. He doesn't know anything about Twitch, though, as far as I know. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. Uh, welcome to Paleontologizing, Monster. It's good to have you here. Uh, yeah, let's see. And, uh, and it then did. Hey, welcome to Paleontologizing. 50 million years is a long time in politics? What do you mean? <laughs> let's see here. But hi, it's great to have you here. Uh, let's see. Very tiny, so everything is close together. Exactly, Dave in accounting. Yes. That's funny, I've had a bunch of people from the UK on my field cruise before. Um, and let me tell you, coming from the UK to Montana is kind of a culture shock and a geography shock for a lot of people. Um... Yeah, for sure. I mean, in the UK, like, if you had to drive three hours, three hours on the highway would be, like, basically from one side of the country to the other, right? In Montana, it's like, yeah, you drive that far to get groceries sometimes. If you're way out in the eastern part of the state where things are really remote. So, yeah. Uh, and Fed Oh, uh, Lindsay says, yeah, Danny, please stay safe on the trip. I will, Lindsay. Thanks for your concern. I appreciate that. Yeah. Uh, let's see here. And Claire, that earthquake command. <laughs> uh, people are going to think that I wrote those commands. I'm like, oh, look at me. Look how calm I am. <laughs> uh, and let's see here. Uh, have I been making any new skulls? I haven't been, Izzy. No, I haven't had time for that. Uh, been really busy trying to get stuff ready for the summer. So, yeah. And... And, Rodan, this is true. Ash layers can preserve fossils. Yeah. Uh, Ash Fossil Bed, Nebraska. I might even get a chance to stop there, Rodan. Yeah. Beautiful place with all of these fossil rhinos that all were entombed in the same spot. Remarkable place. Yeah. That's why I said that we usually don't get fossils in igneous sediments. The thing about Ashfall is that I think that would actually be... I think it actually would be sedimentary rock still. Because um, ash is what forms the sediment. Yeah, it's not like they were entombed in lava or anything. It would have just gotten burned up. Um, but yeah. Three hours in Wales is basically north to south. Yeah, it's big. <laughs> yes. Um... But yeah, yeah. Uh, anywho. David Accounting says, well, I would say three hours uh, would get me pretty much to the south coast from Birmingham. There you go, yeah. Sprock. Thanks for the follow. I appreciate that. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, David Accounting, like eight hours would get you from one side of the country to the other, right? Eight hours from here to Scotland? Yeah. So if you're to drive from one corner of Montana to the other, from like the southwest corner to the northeast corner, I think that would take about 13 or 14 hours. That's just one state in the U.S. For instance, I mean, like, by way of comparison, I mean, uh, I'm going to be driving from Oakland, California, right on the coast, uh up to southeast Montana in Ekalaka. And all told, that'll probably take about probably close to 20 hours. Um, and that's only like a third of the way across the U.S. Uh, it's a big country here. It really is. Um, yeah. And yeah, it is a cool place, Rodan. I would love to visit if I have time. The Ashfall National Fossil Beds. Ashfall Fossil Beds National Park? State Park? I forget what it is. Yeah. I think it's a state park. A lava tube dino cast would be awesome. It would be Spino Breaker. Yes! Yes. Um, and Claire, I will try to remember the uh, Discord DMs. Yes. 
Montana is tough to drive, Pragmatic Entropy. Not as tough as Nevada, I feel. I feel like Nevada might be one of the toughest states to drive. Because there's mostly nothing there in terms of infrastructure. Or, no, I mean, take it back. There's roads. But Nevada's very hot. It just seems to kind of go on forever. There's not a lot of... doesn't seem like the scenery... What am I saying? That's not true at all. Nevada has some incredible geology, and I am looking forward to marveling at its brilliance when I drive across it this summer. Uh, when I drive across it on Friday, really. Um, but yeah. I've never been to the, the UK at all. It's big. I really want to go to the Jurassic Coast near Dorset, but uh, haven't been yet. Yeah. Uh, have not driven Arizona to Mexico? I guess I haven't, no. I've driven from the Bay Area to Arizona. And I've never driven in Texas, no. You're right. You're right. Nebraska's tough. I might be doing Nebraska too, Sprock, this summer. We'll see. Uh, yeah. The closest thing that the U.S. has to... Uh, excuse me. The closest thing that that part of the country has to an ocean. It's like a land ocean. Everything's just flat and there's just crops. As far as the eye can see. It's like being out at sea, I've heard. Um, Spina Breaker. Uh, I, I totally believe that, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and Solid Gray Fox says, It's cool to know how the Native Americans mastered the horse after the Spaniards originally left some behind uh, in the West Coast. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think they... Where did they leave them? I want to say it was, like, uh, somewhere in Mexico that they got left, those horses. And then, yeah. It's like, within a few generations, all of these uh, tribes of Native Americans, First Nations people, you know, like you said, they mastered the horse. Um, and just built their culture around it. In just a few generations. It is kind of astonishing. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Modern Aviation makes good grasslands. It's true, Pragmatic. <laughs> uh, and it speaks as you'd love it. The fossils find you, not the other way around. Has to be a paleontologist dream. Um, you're talking about the Dorset Coast, right? Yeah, absolutely. The land that gave us Mary Anning. Uh, and John 1982. Hey. Welcome. Yeah. Oh, is Doodicarus a dinosaur? It is not. No, it's a uh, uh, Doodicarus is a glyptodont, if I'm remem remembering correctly, a big armored mammal. Let me show you, Doodicarus. Um, yeah, it's basically like a giant armadillo. So this critter is more closely related to you and me than it is to any dinosaur. Uh, that one's kind of a funny looking one. Um, yeah, here's one compared to a baseball player. <laughs> they're they're big animals. You know, it's about the size of a Volkswagen Beetle, the old one. Um, but yeah, they're basically a big old armadillo, kind of. So they are definitely mammals. They are xenarthrin mammals. Uh, like armadillos are. Uh, let's see. Um, holy cow, Spino Breaker, yeah. Is Australia larger or smaller than the U... It's got to be larger than the U.S. Yeah. It has to be. Megafauna, then? Yeah, Empress Eliza. That would be Doodicarus, along with, um... Let's see. Maybe I can find you a good illustration of South American megafauna. Uh, yeah, here we go. Um, what are those? Toxic? No, that's a sloth. That's weird. A hairless sloth. I've never seen that before. Um, it's an interesting way to illustrate them. Along with some glyptodonts, and those might be toxodonts in the back. Uh, yeah, very cool. Um, that's pretty nifty. South American megafauna. Yeah. Really cool critters. 
Uh, he copied Ankylosaurus. There you go, Fede. <laughs> no, there was a cool paper that we went over months ago about uh, about convergent evolution between Glyptodonts and Ankylosaurs. Uh, how Glyptodonts like re-evolved some of the fi- same sorts of features that Ankylosaurs used to have before the extinction of the non-avian dinosaurs. Uh, and interesting, the U.S. is about 1.3 times bigger than Australia? I would not have thought so. Wow, okay. The U.S. is pretty big, yeah. Um, and Empress Eliza, uh, there's a world map where you can drag the countries to the equator? Yeah, it's good to have a, an actual globe that you can use to drag the countries around. Because uh, on like a Mercator projection, there's too much uh, area distortion. Uh... If you take away Alaska. Yeah, Claire, Alaska is really big, but Alaska also, on most maps, it looks larger than it is because of the Mercator projection. Um, but yeah. Anyway. Uh, let's check out another piece of fossil news. We'll wrap up our over after a sort of paper real quick. Uh, uh-huh. Conclusions... Low diversity of Cenognathids in the Namek formation may reflect a broader marginalization of Cenognathids in Asia during the late Cretaceous, possibly as a result of competition with Oviraptorids or other Oviraptorosaurs. I would, I would wager, these critters, the Cenognathids, uh, they might not appear. Well, it's not that they're being outcompeted by more diverse Oviraptorosaurs. I think Oviraptorosaurs are also not as diverse as they've been made out to be. I bet you we will also have more Oviraptorosaurs. Um, let's see. Uh, there we go right here. That's what I was looking for. Um, here's this figure. All of these Oviraptorosaurs come from North America or Asia, I think. Um, And there are lots and lots of different ones that have non-overlapping parts. Um, So, oops, there we go, (laughs) sorry. Uh, The more fossils we find of these guys, the more we can actually figure out which of them are truly different from one another and which are, you know, ontogenetic variation, stratigraphic variation, that kind of thing. I can spend no expense. Um, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Phoenix. I really appreciate that. Thank you kindly. The world's first armored tank, you might say. <laughs> and Ladutix. Thanks for the follow. I appreciate that. It's an ankylosaur right there in that notification. An old-fashioned ankylosaur. We no longer think they looked like that. Um, At least not precisely like that for uh, ankylosaurs. But anyway, yeah. I think that's that's a pretty cool paper. Because it... I suspect that we will see more and more of that in the future. I think a lot of these groups are oversplit. I could be wrong. I could very well be wrong. That's the cool thing about science is actually find out, you know? Somebody's wrong and somebody's right. And yeah, yeah. Someday we'll know. I think that's pretty cool. Uh, and let's see. And Entropy says, I bet we'll find plenty of mutations to name folks after as we expand to more biomes and see cross-speciation. Would you bet against me? Uh, you mean more dinosaurs? We will definitely find more dinosaur taxa in the future. But it seems like the more we study dinosaurs, for the most part, the better handle we have on an ecosystem. Well, no, it kind of goes up, and then it goes down. That's the general kind of way that these these things seem to work. If you look at, like, the Hell Creek Formation in eastern Montana and other parts of the country at the end of the Cretaceous period, when this area was first studied... Like, everything that you found was new. And then new things just kept getting named and named and named and named and named. 
And then eventually, the number starts to come down as we realize that, hey, a lot of these things are actually the same animal. Like with Triceratops, there is something like close to 20 species of Triceratops that have been named. You know, Triceratops hordus, prorsus, Triceratops uricephalus, um, you know, a bunch of other ones. Uh, in fact, let me see if I can show you. Uh, I think if we go to the Wikipedia page, usually, um, it'll have a little thing that'll show us. Synonyms, here we go. So, here, check this out. Um, all of these different... Oh, these are just different genera. <laughs> um, okay, it's even more than I thought. Um, all of these different animals turned out to be the same thing as Triceratops. As far as we can tell. And that's not even all the different species of Triceratops. Uh, which I don't even know if they have a list of that on here. Um... Synonyms and doubtful species. Look at all of these! Holy cow, look at those. Triceratops albertensis, Alticornus, Brevicornus, Calicornus, Elatus, Eurycephalus, Flabellatus, Gallia, Hatchera, Ingens, Maximus, Mortuarius, Obtusus, Serratus, Sulcatus, Sylvestris. These are all different named species of Triceratops. And as far as we know, they only fall out in two or maybe three actual species. And those aren't even necessarily true different species, they seem to just be the same population of Triceratops evolving over time. So Triceratops horridus at the bottom of the Hell Creek seems to evolve into Triceratops prorsus at the top, and there might be another one in between, depending on whether or not you want to call that a different species. We should call all three of those chrono species, because it's not like there's a splitting event that's happening where a different species is splitting off, as far as we can tell. It's just the same animals, the same population, just changing over time. Uh, but yeah, so like I said, generally when you start studying a geologic formation and digging fossils out of it and describing them, diversity for, for these animals goes way up, and then it starts to come down again. And I think, finally, for a lot of these Mongolian geologic formations, like the Jujokta formation, where these oviraptorosaurs come from, we might be seeing that that decline now in number of true species or genera. Number of taxa going down. Uh, but yeah, yeah. We're on the same page? Now? Okay, good, Entropy, good. Yeah, yeah. Uh, let's see. And it's big, it's always freaked me out seeing terror birds. <laughs> I'd feel a bit more inclined toward giving up my dessert to a terror bird. Yes. It's big. Yeah. And I was a kid. There's a, a museum in San Francisco, the California Academy of Sciences. And they used to have this beautiful walk through time exhibit. And they had a big sculpture of uh, like a, a big fleshed out model of two diatrima, which aren't terror birds per se, but they are really big. They're from before the terror birds. Um, uh, but they're, yeah, they're like this. They are big critters. Um, and yeah, these fleshed out models that they had just scared the jeepers out of me when I was a little kid. Um, I think it was the eyes. It looked kind of like this, actually. Yeah. Um, pretty intimidating creature. I'll see if I can find the exact model. I don't know if any photos have ex exist online. Uh, California Academy of Sciences. There it is right there! Holy cow! Wow. I didn't think I would actually be able to see that. I've searched for this before and found nothing. But here it is. Let me make it larger so you can see. Um, yeah. I don't know, just seeing this as a child and it towering over you. Um, I wish this were a higher res photo at a different angle. But it uh, it really unnerved me as a kid. I'd love to see this again today. It's any kind of uh, museum display that's that well put together that it leaves 
like, you know, uh, it has an emotional impact upon you. Any museum exhibit that's really memorable like that is a well-designed exhibit. So, I have a new appreciation for that as somebody who's worked in museums and that kind of thing. And, but man, when I was a kid, it really scared me. Yeah. Um, yeah. Synonym is good on toast, too. There you go, Matt. <laughs> uh, and Empress Eliza asks, at what point does an evolution become a new species? Uh, only when they split off or when they have a major skeletal change? Empress Eliza, that is a phenomenal question. And that is a question that evolutionary biologists ask, ask themselves every day. It becomes kind of arbitrary at a certain point. I mean, even when you have a splitting event that takes place, so say you have a population of, uh, I don't know, squirrels. Let's say that you have squirrels living on an island in, I don't know, an island off the coast of California. And say that there's a volcanic eruption on this island, and uh, suddenly there's like a huge swath of that island that is just uninhabitable now. All the trees get burned down, there's nothing for squirrels to eat, uh, and just for good measure, say a giant chasm opens up. As, as long as we're like making things up. Let's say that there's a giant canyon now, and the squirrels are now two separate populations. They can't get from one side to the other. Dinosaurs became extinct because they no longer knew how to love each other. Welcome, Granite Crow. Thank you again. Exactly. And I certainly wouldn't want our species to end the same way. <laughs> Science. Granite Crow, thank you so much for the 11 months. I really appreciate that. Thank you for your ongoing support. It means a lot to me. Uh... Okay, let's get back to our imaginary scenario here. You've got an island off the coast of California. A bunch of squirrels live there. They're doing their squirrely things. And then there's a... Let's say it's a giant earthquake. The island splits in half, basically. There's a giant canyon now. Squirrels can't get from one side to the other anymore. Given enough time, if both populations manage to survive, they will evolve into different species. Um, they'll just... You know, keep changing and adapting to local environments and that sort of thing until they become different enough that they can no longer interbreed and you'll get speciation occurring. The question is, at what point do you say that they actually are two different species? When do you draw the line? And the answer is, we don't have an answer yet. I don't know if we'll ever really have an answer because it is such a gray area. It's like such a spectrum that... We know nowadays when living things are different species because, well, in some cases we know because they might look very different. They have different habits. They don't interbreed. They live in different environments, whatever. But at some point they did split off. And so the question becomes like, at what point is one, one animal along that line? Is it a different species from its parents? It's like, it, there's never like a strong cutoff there. So it's kind of arbitrary. Again, this is something that always happens when you try and you try and take gray areas in nature and put them into little boxes to classify them you know uh, we're just doing the best we can with really really complicated stuff and we're trying to classify it and uh, it gets tricky when things are really close to each other it could be hard to draw a line between them likewise with uh, with dinosaurs evolving at what point does Triceratops Horridus become Triceratops Prorsus? We don't know. And there's also, seems to be like a, a third species kind of in between there, an intermediate that also looks different from the ones above and the ones below. It's kind of got its own thing going on. But there, the more fossils we find, the more it seems like there's a nice smooth gradation from the ones at the bottom to the ones at the top of these rock layers. So, yeah, yeah, it's a great question. I'm glad you asked it, because it's something that that we as scientists are wrestling with all the time. Uh, so thank you, Empress Eliza. That was a good one. Uh, and let's see, and Claire says, does this happen in other fields of paleontology? Is it because it's so exciting to find a new dinosaur? Uh, I'm just trying to figure out if this is specific to dinosaur paleontology, if there are other parts of this in all the sciences. 
Claire, I think it might be a particular problem in dinosaur paleontology. I'm sure other fields of fossil science also have issues with this kind of thing. I know pale dinosaur paleontology the best, and also... There are... I don't know. Dinosaurs are really cool and really charismatic, compelling animals. And so sometimes... I'm trying to put this in like the most charitable way possible. But sometimes other paleontologists who don't work on dinosaurs... They're of the opinion that some dinosaur science is not very good. Not very rigorous, you know? Almost the dinosaur paleontologists, like, they get all the attention. They're almost kind of the prima donnas of the paleontology world. Uh, to a certain extent, that's probably true. So yeah, it might be a particular problem for dinosaur paleontology. Yeah, yeah. Um, I was really lucky in that in high school, I studied under somebody who doesn't work on dinosaurs. Pat Holroyd works on uh, on mammals and turtles. And so I, I would hear all the time about bad dinosaur science. About studies that wouldn't get published if they were about, you know, uh, ancient whales or um, fossil turtles or something like that. But because it's a dinosaur study and you have dinosaur people reviewing it, they clear it for publication, and... The ponderous Trepodon. Yeah. So yeah, it's a thing. It is a thing. Feet high. 1,500 teeth, and not a single cavity. Monster on Twitch, thank you for the follow. I appreciate that. Welcome to Paleontologizer. Thanks for clicking that follow button. Uh, so yeah, yeah. Uh, squirrely things. There you go, Cooking with Lordy. <laughs> uh... And, uh, oh, you got to see Dippy the Diplodocus in Wales? That's so cool, it's big. Very, very cool specimen. Diplodocus carnegii, really cool animal. Yeah. Uh, and Spino Breaker says, well, if you start at dark gray and go to light gray, when is it not gray? Exactly, Spino Breaker, exactly. Yeah. Uh, and Wanapata, I have not finished the Velociraptor puppet yet. I'm not going to finish her before I leave for the summer. I'm leaving on Thursday now. It's coming up. And my 3D printer is on the fritz, so I can't print her skull, her head, or anything. So that'll be a project for when I get back. Um, but I'm very excited about it. It's gonna be really neat. Fluffcat Wizard, how are you doing? Welcome back. Yeah. Uh. And let's see. Ag Magnus3 says, if you don't mind me asking, how do you create a body slash shape for the dinosaurs? How do you distribute fat and muscles? These are great questions. How do you find out where the major organs are placed and how big they are? Can you find out stuff out through the bones or how the dinosaurs are preserved? You're... This is like an entire field of study that you're describing. Uh, Magnus, that is... Uh, that is wonderful. What you're describing is like dinosaur reconstruction. And there are a lot of very passionate, very hardworking paleontologists who try and solve these problems. Some of it is speculative, and you'll see different different reconstructions of dinosaurs that might look very different from one another. But with really careful study and enough good fossil specimens, you can start to figure some of this stuff out really in a way that uh, is verifiable from the fossil record. Uh, let me show you an example. Uh, let me think of a good example here. Um, who would be a good dinosaur? We can start off with a guanodon. Everybody loves a guanodon. Uh, let's see. Boron four two one. Dinosaur. Thank you for the follow. Welcome to paleontologizing. Uh. I'll give you an example, um, Magnus. Back in the early 1800s, there was an English doctor uh, 
who, depending on who you believe, it was either he or his wife found these fossil teeth. Um, and he didn't quite know what they were, so he did some study, and eventually he and some other naturalists at the time determined that they came from a large iguana-like creature. So they called the animal Iguanodon, which means iguana tooth. And uh, shortly thereafter, they found some other fossils of this animal. Uh, here we go, there. And they put together kind of a rough reconstruction, and they, they thought it looked something like this right here. Um, they thought it was basically like a giant iguana. And some more pieces were found, and reconstructions like this popped up. Um, this is one of the very first dinosaurs to ever be discovered, or at least ever published on in a scientific capacity. Um, one of the first dinosaurs to ever be, you know, studied scientifically, I guess you could say. Um, and, uh, yeah, so using a few of these elements, they were able to figure out a few key things about the animal. They figured out that its legs were upright under its body, because that's the way that they're shaped. Um, like the... The hip socket is, like, at a right angle. The acetabulum and the femur head fit together at a right angle like that. So they knew it didn't sprawl out to the side like a lizard. So basically, they reconstructed it to look like this. Kind of like an overgrown lizard with big elephant-style legs directly under its body. This is what they thought Iguanodon looked like at the time. Um, and that's the way that it stayed for a long time. Until, uh, let's see... Until years later, some complete skeletons were found in a town called Bernissar in Belgium. And using those complete skeletons, they were able to reconstruct the animal. They realized that its back legs were longer than its front legs. They thought that it walked upright like this. They gave it kind of a Godzilla-style pose. Because they had found multiple complete skeletons like this in a coal mine. Uh, like dozens of skeletons. And you can still see these in Brussels in the Natural History Museum there. Um, but yeah, yeah. And so... Uh, also, looking at all these bones, they're able to tell where some of the muscles fit and that kind of thing. It's starting to come together a little bit. You can actually tell where certain muscles fit and how big they are based on what we call muscle scars on bones, which are basically like rough patches on the bone that correspond to where the muscles are anchored. So like during the animal's life, the bone will actually be deformed a little bit by the muscle pulling on it, kind of scouring its surface a little bit. So muscle scars are a great way to help, you know, figure out how big the muscles are and where they attach. Uh, but after that, I mean, it became increasingly clear that like with further study that iguanodon was being reconstructed incorrectly. It didn't actually walk upright like a kangaroo. Those bones in its tail would have to break to get the tail to bend at that angle. Uh, and so actually, there we go. Uh, oh, I wish that were a larger image. Here, I'll try and make it larger for you. But right here, this is how Iguanodon is reconstructed nowadays. We think mostly it walked on it all fours again, um, with its tail held out directly behind it. Like, uh, a lot like this. Or like this right here. Um, much more graceful animal than the big, plodding, you know, thick-legged one from the 1820s to the 1850s. Uh, so yeah, and our picture of dinosaurs is getting refined each and every year with new discoveries. Um, now that we realize that birds evolved from dinosaurs, suddenly a lot of different aspects of dinosaur anatomy had to be reinterpreted. And we now think of dinosaurs as being very, very bird-like. Um, with a lot of the same characteristics that birds would have had. And it's like the more that we our perspective on these things changes, the more we can kind of look at previous interpretations of data and figure out where they were wrong. And the picture starts to become a little bit more clear. Things start to fall together. It's like putting pieces together in a puzzle until you can start to see the full image there. And the more pieces that you find the clearer that picture becomes. 
It's kind of the ongoing story of dinosaur paleontology. I like to say that all of our pictures of dinosaurs are wrong in some details, but they're getting less wrong every time we find out new information. It's like we're getting ever closer to how dinosaurs actually were. You know, there is real progress being made. And that's really cool and really exciting. You know, that's, that's one of the reasons I get up in the morning, you know? So, yeah. Uh, and Fluffcat Wizard says, Hey, question, would you enjoy it if I sent you some dinosaur art? Uh, but yeah, that'd be awesome, Fluffcat Wizard. Are you uh, part of the Discord yet? Um, I would love to see some dinosaur art. I think we have a, uh, like, a crew member art channel on there. So check that out. We'd, we'd love to see your work. And I can even show it off live on stream if you would like. Um, but yeah. And let's see. What did I, what did I miss here? Uh-huh. Uh, yeah, so I hope that answered your question, Magnus. Um... Yeah, we can find out a lot about dinosaurs, if, especially if we have very good fossils. I'll show you a fossil that kind of changed dinosaur paleontology forever. Um, I've shown this a lot here on stream, but it's really important. This right here is Sinoceropteryx. This is a, a super important dinosaur. Um... Because if you look closely along its back right there, you'll see this beautiful kind of brown fringe of little filamentous feathers that run all along the animal's back. This is one of those fossils that first, like, alerted us to the fact that, hey, a lot of these animals had feathers. We didn't know that before because most of these fossils are not that well preserved. But gorgeous ones like this are... Occasionally you get really, really lucky and you find an extraordinarily well-preserved dinosaur that has integument on it. Skin or feathers, either like proto-feathers like this or full-on flight feathers sometimes. And so, if you've heard that dinosaurs had feathers, not only is that true, but it's because since the late 1990s we've been finding more and more fossils like this that demonstrate beyond the shadow of a doubt that some of these animals had coatings of feathers on their bodies. This particular one, Sinoceropteryx, is so well-preserved uh, that we can actually figure out what colors it was, which is really, really neat. So nowadays, we think that this animal uh, was kind of a ruddy, rusty orange color, kind of a brownish orange with white stripes running down its tail, because that is actually, it shows up in the fossil itself. Um, yeah, really, really cool. This is... Uh, this is amazing. Because when I was a kid, you know, in the 1990s, there were a zillion dinosaur books that always said, you know, we'll, we'll never know what color dinosaurs were, so just don't worry your pretty little head about it, you know? If you're drawing a picture of a dinosaur, just empty out the crayon box and go nuts. We still don't really know what, what colors most dinosaurs were, but for a few of them, we're starting to figure it out. And that's one of those things that a lot of people assumed we'd never be able to do. But now we can. So like anything in the sciences, you know, never bet against discovery. Never bet against learning new things. Never say, can't know. Tank, you might say. Thank you, Oski. I appreciate the follow. Plate. Welcome to Paleontologizing. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, yeah. Science is incredible like that. Uh, and it's because there are thousands upon thousands of very passionate, very hardworking people all around the world who devote their lives to trying to solve these problems. And finding new things out. And kind of wanting to be proven wrong. That's the cool thing about science is that if somebody demonstrates that you were wrong about something that's a really good thing because it means that the science is advanced it means that you've learned something new so every good scientist will always celebrate when he or she has been proven wrong are put together correctly the bones <laughs> you're smart what do you think 
doing research on that, I, Oliver. I, I never. <laughs> Thank you for the follow there, Lexmix Games. I appreciate that. Welcome. Uh, and it's not a moon, says he probably mentioned it on a couple of times before on the stream. A bunch of times, actually. Do I think T Rex was a fast or slow hunter or a scavenger? The answer is yes, yes, and yes. One of the things that gets forgotten about dinosaurs a lot uh, is that they change a lot as they grow and mature. Some of these animals get really, really big. Tyrannosaurus is a good example. You know, 40 feet long or more when full grown. That's what, like 13 meters? And they didn't start off that size. They started off pretty small. Um, this is a lovely illustration of that right here. Um, so yeah, when T-Rex was small, it was small. It hatched out of an egg smaller than a football. You know, dinosaur eggs were not as large as you might imagine. They don't get larger than about this. So a baby T-Rex is about this size. And it has to grow from that to this huge hulking adult over the course of about 20 to maybe 30 years. But along the way, it's going through these different growth stages. So it starts off as probably a pretty fast, agile little hunter. Um, a lot like the juvenile Tyrannosaurus skeleton that you see behind me right here. Um, this thing is, you know, it's not as tall as I am. It's longer than I am if I were to lay down on the ground. But yeah, so it's not super big. But it does have very long legs, it's very lightly built, it would have been a very fast runner, I would imagine. So this probably was a pursuit predator, when it's about, you know, this stage right here. They get larger, they're still very leggy, probably very fast, but when they are adults, you know, they are much stockier, probably slower moving. So maybe when they were full-grown adults, they wouldn't even have to hunt anymore. Maybe they could just bully other Tyrannosaurus away from their kills and walk around and eat whenever they want. Or maybe they were ambush predators. It doesn't seem like they're super fast when they're at this growth stage, but I bet even even just a brisk walk for a full-grown Tyrannosaurus like this would be probably faster than you could run. So I wouldn't call them slow, per se. It's a big animal. And they're probably more lightly built, or they're probably a little bit lighter weight than you might imagine especially for an animal that size. Because they're very bird-like. They have so many of the same adaptations that, that birds have in their bodies. All the, like, cool weight-saving tips and tricks that birds have, they didn't invent all of those. They inherited a lot of those from their dinosaur ancestors. The theropods, the two-legged meat-eating dinosaurs like T-Rex. So, yeah. Uh, it's a great question. It's not a moon. Um, T-Rex is both a fast-moving pursuit predator when it was young, and maybe a slower-moving ambush predator, or when it could manage that, a scavenger when it was full-grown. So, yeah. Uh, and hello, Boron421. Welcome to Paleontologizer. Sorry it took me a minute to get to you, but welcome. Uh, anyway, let's see here. Moving on down through chat... So fluffy, yeah! Sinusoropteryx is a pretty cute dinosaur. Uh, and Empress Eliza says, do the larger dinosaurs have feathers? Kind of like we have fur, or we don't know if not really? We don't know for most of them yet, Empress Eliza, but there are a few key uh, dinosaurs, like uh, Eutyrannus. This is an ancestor of later Tyrannosaurs. And we know that it had feathers all over its body. Uh, we have good fossils to demonstrate this. This is a big animal. This is not a small dinosaur that would have necessarily needed insulation just because it's tiny. Uh, I like this one a lot. <laughs> it's like super fluffy. <laughs> uh, that's a lovely one. Oh, I like that a lot. Pretty cool. Um, yeah, yeah. So this is an animal like the size of a school bus, basically. It's big. So at least some dinosaurs had feathers that were this large. 
Um, we're really lucky with this one because it's its fossils were very well preserved. Where they actually have feather impressions on them. You can kind of see them right there. They're faint, but they're there. Most dinosaur fossils are not well preserved enough in that we don't have any kind of integument preserved, whether it's scaly skin or feathers. Some dinosaurs we do have scaly skin impressions from, but we don't know if they had feathers in addition to those scales. We don't have any dinosaurs yet where all of the integument is preserved. It would solve a lot of problems if we did. Someday it'll happen, I think. But it's not that day yet. Uh, and Pragmatic Entropy says, So lots of iron? How do we know it was orange? Or is it some melanin count? Yeah, it is melanosomes. Uh, like looking at the color cells in Sinusoropteryx. In fact, I can show you. Um, uh -huh. Sinusoropteryx. From the presence of melanosome, special melanosomes that make and store red pigment, they concluded that the darker feathers of Sinusoropteryx were chestnut or reddish brown in color. More research on the coloration of Sinusoropteryx reveals that it had a raccoon-like bandit mask and countershading patterns most likely associated with an open habitat, indicating that the G-hole biota, this is the environment that it lived in, likely had a range of habitat types. Uh, and there you go right there. There's a restoration. Oops. Restoration. Oop. Hang on. I gotta switch to the other view so you can see. Restoration of this animal and its potential coloration. Well, it's... It's now more or less confirmed coloration. Pretty cool, if you ask me. Yeah. Uh, and... Is that a raptor? Asked Dread Pirate Roberts. It's a... Compsognathan theropod? So it's not super close. This is actually... This little guy right here is closer to Tyrannosaurs than it is to, say, Velociraptor or something like that. Um, it's also pretty small. Um, not a big critter. Uh, but we do know that the raptor dinosaurs, or what paleontologists call dromaeosaurs, they did have feathers. Uh, uh, that's really cool. Looks like a uh, secretary bird. <laughs> Pretty sweet. Here's some lovely Emily Willoughby art. She might be one of the paleo artists who's best at doing... Uh, uh, feathered dinosaurs. She's kind of a leader in in that area. Uh, yeah, there's another one right here. A John Sibic illustration of a feathered dromaeosaur. So yeah, we now know that all of these guys, including Velociraptor, right here, had feathers all over their bodies. They would have looked like big, nasty, ground-running murder eagles. Um, that's pretty cool. I like that. Nice stylized image. <laughs> Their tails are not that flexible, though. Uh, yeah. Oh, I like that with the young riding on the back. That's so cool. Oh, man, I like that a lot. <laughs> That's beautiful. I love this piece of art. That's so neat. Let's take a closer look at that. Um, oh, hang on. Let's see. I don't like that. Uh... Yeah, you see how the young... There's so much going on in this picture. I love this. So look at the one who's going up like that, the little baby. It's got these streaks down it, just like a baby emu. Uh, just like birds, dinosaurs probably also changed a lot in appearance as they grew and matured, including in their plumage. So these little baby dromaeosaurs. They've got those little stripes, probably for camouflage, helping to disguise them from predators. And this one right here running up its parent's back. It's doing what we call WAIR, W-A-I-R, wing-assisted incline running. This is a behavior that we see in a lot of young birds, like uh, partridges and quails and stuff like that, um, where they'll kind of flap as they're running up an inclined surface in order to help them gain a little bit more momentum and lift. That's very cool. Very, very cool. I like that illustration a lot. That's, that's pretty awesome. Uh, so yeah. Yeah, we've learned a lot about theropod dinosaurs and their appearance in recent years, and it's really changed the way that we look at these animals. Uh, yeah. Uh, 
Uh -huh. Lemix Games, welcome to you. It's good to have you here. Uh, and Spino Breaker, I totally agree with that. It's a good rule, yes. Uh, and Lemix Games says, just on... Uh, some mints came across stream in... It's like half four in the morning here in Sweden now. Well, greetings from Oakland, California. It's uh, 6.36 p.m. in California right now. I hope you've had a wonderful day over there in Sweden. And thanks for dropping by. It's good to have you here. Uh, yeah. And Solid Gray Fox says, I've been writing on my writing my thesis on the implementa implementation of productive changes in education systems. This is a good example for what should be an encouraging classroom setting. Solid Gray Fox, thank you. That is one of the best compliments you could have given me. I really appreciate that. I'm glad you're having a good time, and, uh, yeah, yeah, thank you for saying so. That's awesome. Uh, and, uh, Overlapping Magisteria, hey, I've heard of the opposite of that, uh, but thanks for being here, Overlapping Magisteria. Good to see you. Yeah, it's a Stephen Jay Gould thing. So, got a question. Given how complex of thought and tool use crows are, is is it likely their ancestors may have had similar complexity? I.e., could a tool using civilization of equivalent complexity but different expression have arisen from crow ancestors given enough time? I suppose it's possible, yeah. But, I mean, you've got to ask yourself how advantageous is tool use, really, that evolution would select for that over time. I think there's a, a pitfall that you could fall into. In that, like, as human beings, we think of the world in our terms, you know? We tend to anthropomorphize creatures that we look at and think of their behavior in terms of, like, human choices and emotions and that kind of thing, and human intelligence. Over, you know, birds have been around for goodness, about 100 and 150 million years. And they've never really evolved super complex tool use, you know? Maybe there would be changes that occur in an environment that would cause some species of bird to use more and more complex tools, but it doesn't really, I don't know, it hasn't happened yet. And if it hasn't happened in 150 million years, I don't know why we why we would expect it to. There's a great book about this that I can recommend to you. Um, here it is right here. Um, you can also get it as an audiobook, but it's called The Genius of Birds by Jennifer Ackerman. And uh, it talks all about what we know about bird intelligence and research that's been done on it and like a cool kind of narrative format. It's a lot of fun. It's like a popular science book. Um, and apparently it's a New York Times bestseller, The Genius of Birds. Um, I've been reading it as an audiobook, and it's pretty good. Um, but yeah, it, the takeaways that I've had from it so far are that b A, birds are really smart. B, we don't really know what smart means or how to define it. Um, and C, this sort of thing is difficult to study, and if we don't really understand in intelligence in modern birds, whom we can actually see in the laboratory and experiment on and interact with, you know, how could we hope to to know very much about, like, dinosaur intelligence, you know? Because even if you look at, like, gross morphology, you, like, you look at brain size in birds, and you try and correlate that with level of intelligence, whatever that means, however you define that, there isn't a direct correlation. Like, it's a weird, complex relationship that we haven't figured out yet. So trying to determine how intelligent dinosaurs would have been based on that is even more tricky, you know? So, yeah, yeah. I'd highly recommend that book, and that's a great question. I appreciate it. Yeah. And It's Big it's big C wants to know, what did T-Rex use its arms for? Um, probably nothing. Although that's maybe a discussion for another time, because we just got a raid from Roscoe. How are you doing, Roscoe? How was your stream? It is great to have you here, Roscoe. Thank you for bringing your community once again. And I certainly wouldn't want our species to end the same way. We're trying out these new notifications, and they seem to be going pretty well. 
if the situation um, called for still more protection. Yeah, I've got to scroll down through chat. I'm sorry, everybody. I'm skipping your messages. I've got to say hello to the Raiders. Uh, but yeah, and I'm seeing your message right now, Apocalypse. Lost in the Raid. Repost it, if you don't mind. Um, but yeah, anyway. Roscoe, how was your stream? Uh, I hope it was wonderful. Thank you for bringing your community here. It is so great to see everybody. Um, how you guys doing? I feel like I should introduce myself really quick. Uh, my name is Danny Anduza, and I'm a dinosaur paleontologist. I'm here on Twitch, trying to do some good old-fashioned science outreach. And doing my best to look at the right camera. I'm getting used to this new one that I set up, so that you can see some of my uh, fossil replicas behind me. Including this life-size juvenile Tyrannosaurus that I'm very proud of. That's actually based in part on a specimen that I helped dig up back in 2014. That's Museum of the Rockies specimen uh, 6025, I think? M-O-R 6025? Chomper Rex? Well, yeah, anywho. Um, yeah. Uh, so I'm just here on Twitch just trying to do some good old-fashioned science outreach, answer people's questions about fossils, and especially dinosaurs, because that's my wheelhouse. And, uh, yeah. Yeah! Uh, and... Mad McMahon, Roscoe House Gout? I'm sorry to hear that. Um, and you accidentally burned down someone's Minecraft house. Roscoe. Well, maybe that's their fault for making their house out of such flammable material. Um, but thank you, Roscoe. I really appreciate you bringing your audience here. This is awesome. Uh, but yeah, yeah. Uh, Fox Gloves, welcome to Paleontologizer. Uh, and very cool Dead Men's Boots. Finished doodling a Jurassic Park T-Rex. Pretty neat. Uh, and Frost Fletcher says, I never knew I needed a dinosaur stream. What a gift. Welcome to Paleontologizing. Hey, I'm getting ready to uh, to leave on a big cross-country trip on this coming Thursday. Going to be going all across the American West, visiting different dinosaur museums and fossil sites, and streaming all along the way. So I hope you'll join me for that. But in the meantime... What do you say we play a quick little welcome video to kind of introduce some some new people to the stream here? Uh, give me some ones in chat if you like that idea. And I will introduce somebody whom I like to call previously recorded Danny. Um, all right, I'm seeing some ones here. Okay. Well, everybody who's new, stick around for this video. Uh, this is a different one from the one I played earlier in the stream, by the way. I've got multiple welcome videos so they don't get boring. But you know what? Here he comes now, previously recorded, Danny. So I'm going to go ahead and let him take over. Go ahead and take it away, previously recorded, Danny. Thanks, present day Danny. You know, people ask me all the time, Danny, how did you first get interested in paleontology? And I've always been interested in fossils from the earliest time I can remember, particularly dinosaurs. My parents like to say that I decided I wanted to become a paleontologist pretty much the moment I realized I couldn't grow up to be a dinosaur. And believe me, I tried. I was born and raised in the San Francisco Bay Area, which is a lovely place to grow up. Except that we haven't got any dinosaur fossils here. So right after high school, I packed up and moved to Montana, one of the best places in the world to find dinosaurs. Just a couple days after I arrived in Montana, I started working at the lab at Museum of the Rockies and the paleontology program founded by Jack Horner. Jack's done a lot of amazing things in his career, but you may know him as the scientific advisor on the movie Jurassic Park. You consulted on that movie. I did consult on the, all and those movies. And they said the, the guy, Alan Grant, was you. <laughs> yes, yeah, well, fortunately he didn't get eaten. <laughs> <laughs> but we wanted a credible resource that could back up several theories that we were sort of expounding. And one was that dinosaurs eventually evolved into birds. And even the word raptor means bird of prey. And that's something that Jack Horner believes in and could defend if necessary. And Jack Horner became our credibility. It was in this program that Jack built that I learned how to be a dinosaur paleontologist and how to think outside the box. I've done work at a number of other museums around the American West, helping to prep fossils, design exhibits, and educate visitors. I did a fair bit of eclectic field work in various places, identifying and collecting early Cretaceous dinosaur tracks on the Idaho border, 
Sphenodontian fossils in the gravelly range of the Rocky Mountains, Cenozoic fishes in western Nevada, but most of my work out in the field was with Dr. Denver Fowler, who is now curator of the Badlands Dinosaur Museum. In all, I've worked probably a few hundred sites throughout the late Cretaceous of Montana, and the Hell Creek and Judith River formations, digging up dinosaurs. Lots and lots and lots of dinosaurs. And from time to time, that work has even garnered some media attention. Montana's news leader. Five paleontologists are excavating what looks to likely be a new species of armored dinosaur. So we found its head and we found parts of its armor and plates. And so it, it should be a new species. And uh, much like my field work, my research focuses on dinosaurs. I'm particularly interested in their behavioral functional morphology. All these bizarre anatomical features that certain dinosaurs had, I want to know what they used them for. Right now, I'm working on a study on spinosaurs. All right, but don't ask me too much about that because it's uh, still a project in the works and I can't give away too much just yet till it's published. But anyway, a couple years ago, I realized that things were definitely headed downhill in Montana. So I packed up and headed back to the West Coast. And I've become kind of fed up with all the bullshit in academia, so uh, I found myself another job. I am now a teacher in early childhood education. And let me tell you, it's been a natural fit since day one. Now, given that I get to design the curriculum, my students now know more about biology, classification, and the history of life on Earth than most adults do. I've been helping raise a new generation of young scientists. Then, coronavirus hit. In mid-March, when all the schools shut down in San Francisco, I started holding classes over Zoom, and we picked up right where we left off. One, two, three. I love digging in the dirt with just a pick and brush. Finding fossils is my aim, and so I'm never in a rush because the treasures that I see a rare and ancient thing, so like Velociraptor's jump, or Archaeopteryx's wings, and all the kids who want to see them lining up at a home museum. I am a paleontologist. That's who I am, that's who I am, that's who I am. I am a paleontologist. I realized that I really enjoy teaching remotely. So back in May, I decided to try streaming on Twitch. And here we are. This is my passion. And now I get to share it with you. And what could be cooler than that? I believe that scientists ought to be public servants. Ultimately, it's our job not just to make scientific discoveries, but to teach the public about them. That's exactly what I want to do here. Now, because of COVID-19, this will be my first summer in almost 10 years with no fieldwork. I'm trying to look on the bright side, though. It's not all bad. It, at least I have more time for outreach. And I've got plenty of cool stuff to work on. And if you could throw some support my way by subscribing, I'd be incredibly grateful. So anyway, if you are new here, you should be pretty well clued in by now. And uh, I'm glad you're here. I hope you're having a good time. Anyway, let's uh, see what present day Danny has cooked up for us. All right, present day Danny, back to you. Well, thank you very much, previously recorded Danny. And, uh, Thank you again to Roscoe for the wonderful raid. I really appreciate it, man. Thank you so much. That, uh, <laughs> that's wonderful. So thank you. Bringing all these cool people here. Now, I should also say something real quick that previously recorded Danny had failed to mention, and it's that while last summer I didn't get to do any field work because of COVID-19, I didn't really leave my apartment much, to be honest. This summer I'm getting back out there. And uh, on this coming Thursday, I'm leaving on a big cross-country road trip, going all over the American West. 
visiting the different museums and field sites and trying to stream as much as I can. So I hope you'll join up for that. And then once I get to Montana, I've got some cool stuff that I'm doing, including uh, the Dino Shindig, big like celebration of paleontology with local Montanans and dinosaur paleontologists from around the country. It's going to be really neat. Uh, I'll be streaming that too. But after that, I'm at kind of a crossroads. Um, I'm not sure where the rest of my summer is going to go. I'm either going to be joining up with the field crew and doing some field work and hopefully doing a lot of streaming from there. So digging up dinosaurs. Or, failing that, if that doesn't work out because of COVID-related stuff or logistics or whatever, then I'm going to be teaming up with uh, Lordy from Cooking with Lordy. And we're going to be doing a great big second half of this road trip. Um going from Montana all the way out east to the Great Lakes, and then down diagonally to the Grand Canyon, stopping at dinosaur museums and other sites along the way, doing a bunch of streaming. It is going to be a lot of fun. So either way that shakes out, either field work with a dinosaur dig, or you know another big part of this road trip, visiting museums and stuff, it's going to be really cool either way. And I hope you'll join me for that. Um, it should be a lot of fun. So... I'm pretty excited about it. Uh, so yeah, yeah, let's see here. Um, uh -huh -huh. And again, everybody who followed from, or dropped in from Roscoe's channel, I hope you stick around. Um, we generally have a pretty good time around here. And uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, so King Pish, hello to you. Uh, True Zen, good to see you back. Yeah. Um, the ponderous Krakodon, 32 feet. Stever Fritz. 14 feet high. Thank you for the follow. I appreciate that. Uh, just trying to cruise down through the messages real quick before we get on with the rest of our fossil news from today. Um, Sierra loves nature. Sense sounds like a dream. It's going to be pretty cool. It really is. Um, and Fraz Fletcher says I work in TV in Scotland, and I think this dude needs a series. I'm 100 percent invested right now. Fraz, welcome to Paleontologizing. You flatter me, my goodness. Um, thank you for the kind words. Uh, I wouldn't turn down a TV series if it were offered to me. Um, yeah, holy cow. So glad you're here. Uh, and Dynaticus says, Danny, if it's not too sore of a topic, just curious. What drove you away from it? What drove me away from what? From academia, maybe? Uh, I could tell you some stories. But basically... I don't know. I don't come from an academic background. Neither of my parents went to college. A first-generation college student, and especially here in the United States, there's like... I don't know. It's tough to be a first-generation college student, especially if you have to work to support yourself during that. School is really expensive here in the U.S. Um, and yeah, it just wasn't a system that worked for me, really. Uh, I feel like there are a lot of aspects about academia where you're kind of working to serve the system rather than the system working to serve you, you know? Again, that's my point of view. Your own mileage will vary. So, yeah, yeah. Um, but I could tell you some stories. Oh, man. <laughs> uh, yeah, academia, sorry. Yeah, yeah, no worries, Dynaticus. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, anyway. Oh, and thank you, Claire, for reminding me about funding. You'll see the sub goal at the bottom of the page right here. Uh, that is to help pay for mobile data during the summer. Cellular data. So I can live stream all of this stuff outdoors. It is, uh, it's really expensive. <laughs> um, so any help I can get with that is very much appreciated. Uh, so yeah. And again, I would not be able to, to stream like this this often uh, with all of this, you know, wonderful equipment like the camera I'm using right now if it weren't for the wonderful support of all these dedicated and very generous viewers um, so thank you everybody for all of your support it means so much to me uh, yeah and uh, Dynaticus kind of took the same path and thought the same thing myself got to see I wasn't the only one yeah Dynaticus there's a lot of us there are a lot of us uh I'm glad you don't feel alone there. Um, and thanks for saying so. It's good to have that kind of connection, you know? 
Uh, and yeah, it is hard, Barry Kirby. Absolutely, it's hard to be a first-generation college student. Dark Tarconis, thank you. Holy cow. <laughs> yes. Thank you very much for your support there, Dark Dark Comics. Dark Dark just changed things with those five gift subs. I really appreciate your support, Dark Honest. That, that's wonderful. That's the first time I've seen that notification, too. Wow, I like it. I like it a lot. <laughs> uh, uh, and, uh, let's see, you gotta hop into a work meeting? Uh, thank you, True Zen. Peace to you, too. Hope your meeting goes well. Um, wish you the best of luck with it. Uh, yeah. And, uh, Alone in Kyoto says academia is a trash fire. <laughs> Went to doctorate level and still in the system, teaching only, thankfully. Oof, yeah. Uh, the stories I could tell you, Kyoto. Holy moly. Yeah. It's, it's rough out there. Um, and it seems like it's getting rougher. Uh, and that is indeed the movie that's from Mayor Space. Good spot. Yeah. Um, of course, that falls under your jurisdiction, uh, as mayor. So, yeah. Uh, oh, and Dr. E, thank you for being here. Thanks for the, uh, the viewership, and you get some good rest, Dr. E. Um, I'll see you again soon, hopefully. Uh, and you too, Boron. Thank you very much for being here. I appreciate that. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, let's get into some more fossil news here. Uh, we were talking about this earlier, a new Ovaraptorosaur dinosaur, or a new specimen, rather, that actually helps us consolidate two other Ovaraptorosaurs we used to think were different. Turns out they're the same animal. I say this a lot, but a lot of the dinosaurs we think are different are actually the same thing. I feel kind of vindicated by this new paper. Uh, we went over this earlier, but for anybody who's new and wants to take a look, I will uh, post the link for you. Holy cow! <laughs> Dynaticus! Thank you so much! <laughs> I really appreciate that, Dynaticus. Thank you so much. That's wonderful. Um, thank you kindly. Orbital Gun! Thank you. Dynaticus and Orbital Gun. I really appreciate you guys. And Dynaticus, this is your first time here, right? Let's protect our fossils, because if they're in the... We've got a hype train going here. How did I miss that? We're at like a level five already. Lenina, thank you for the hundred bits. <laughs> ah, this is my first time trying out these notifications, too. And, uh, I like them. I like them a lot. World, there are fewer than 40 full-time dinosaur paleontologists. Dork Apocalypse? Yeah. Holy cow! Thank you so much for your support. Holy moly! <laughs> Apocalypse, thank you for the five gift subs. That is phenomenal. And Orbital Gun, thank you for three more subs there. You guys are incredible. Sierra loves nature. Thank you for the hundred bits. That is really lovely. Really spectacular. Spent no expense. Phenomenal. Thank you so much. Yeah. Sierra loves nature. Says thank you for teaching science on Twitch. Much needed. Thank you for supporting science outreach on Twitch. Sierra loves nature. Yeah. Um, and Geezer Yomi, Dark Apocalypse is a cool guy. You're absolutely right. Cool guy or gal or whoever. Yeah. Thank you for teaching science on Twitch. Much needed. We didn't come here to fight with monsters. We came here to find fossils. Alone in Kyoto, thank you for the follow. I appreciate that very much. Fortunus Bounce! Holy cow! Thank you for that gift, those gift subs, five of them. Holy cow, Fortuitous Bounce. That's nuts, I really appreciate that. Thank you. Fortuitous Bounce just gifted five subs. Thank you so much. Optic Nervous, this channel is just glorious. 
It's more glorious now that you're here, uh, Optic Nerf. Thank you for your viewership and your kind words. Thanks for helping make this such a positive uh, experience. Yeah. Phenomenal. Um, sub spam, everyone. <laughs> Hi, Ro, yeah! <laughs> uh, that's funny. I'm going to have to modify some of those because they're not quite loud enough yet. But I'll, I'll work on it, yeah. Um, holy cow, we're at 243% of a level 5 hype train. Might just have to play some ukulele songs for everybody. Um, normally we do that when we get to a level 5 hype train. And I'd be more than happy to do that for you. Really Maybe in a little bit. Um, gifted optic underscore Nova subscription. Thank you, Paddle. That's a worthy recipient right there. Yeah. <laughs> Claire Burr says funding song? Oh, you mean the science funding song? I could do that, Claire Burr, I guess. Yeah. We've been talking about academia and science funding. and Would you guys want to hear a kind of a sad song about science funding? A goofy sad song? Um, yeah. Give me, uh, give me some twos in chat if you would like to hear some ukulele songs. And maybe I'll play some for you. Uh, yeah, man, this is fun. I wasn't sure if I wanted to stream today, because I still have to get a ton of stuff ready before I leave on Thursday, but I'm so glad I did decide to stream. Um, holy moly, I'm seeing some twos there. Um, an apocalypse? Yes! I will start with I'm a paleontologist, and then we'll move on to the science funding song. Um, it's called Jolene. You may have heard a, a different version of it before. Some would say a better version. Make sure this thing's in tune. Uh, Ballad of Peer Review. <laughs> uh, no, it's about the travails of trying to find funding. All right, we're in tune. This thing's holding up really well. Holding in tune. Uh, let me close that for now. Um, yeah, let's sing uh, I'm a Paleontologist first. This is a big thank you to everybody who contributed to that level 5 hype train. Holy cow. Let me drink some water and then play a song from the band They Might Be Giants from their Here Comes Science album. Mm. All right. <clears throat> it's been a while since I've played this. This kind of became like a, a theme song for me and my students over the past couple years. But it goes... Uh, I love digging in the dirt with just a pick and brush. But finding fossils is my aim, and so I'm never in a rush because the treasures that I see, they're rare and ancient things like Velociraptor's jaws or Archaeopteryx's wings. And all the kids who want to see them are lining up at our museum. I am a paleontologist That's who I am, that's who I am, that's who I am I am a paleontologist That's who I am, that's who I am, that's who I am Could it be an herbivore Crushing plants with rounded teeth Or a ferocious carnivore Who moves so quickly on its feet It's like pieces of a puzzle but I'd love to try and solve So much fun to think about How a species has evolved And all the kids Who wanna see them Are lining up At our museum I am a paleontologist That's who I am That's who I am That's who I am I am a paleontologist That's who I am that's who I am, that's who I am That's who I am, that's who I am, that's who I am That's who I am, that's who I am, that's who I am Alright, let me get some more water And, uh, hmm Thanks everybody for listening Man, I wish before this next song that's something else to drink, because it's a little bit goofy. Um, here it is. I gotta look up the chords and the lyrics real quick. And I'll move that over here to there. 
And let's see. <clears throat> you may have heard this song before. It's kind of a, an old standard. Um, written by kind of a genius musician and singer. I've modified it a little bit to make it about science funding. But I feel like the general emotional gist of the song is still there. That's unchanged. It's just about a slightly different topic. And I think it goes like this. There we go. Jolene, 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 Jolene. I'm begging of you, please don't take my grant. Jolene, 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 Jolene. Please don't take it even though you can. Your research is impressive stuff, and surely it is good enough for nature. For tenure, you don't need the funds, Jolene. Your papers are exemplary Citations, you got so much more than me And I cannot compete with you, Jolene Jolene, 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 Jolene I'm begging of you, please don't take my grant Jolene, 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 Jolene Please don't take it just because you can and I could easily understand How you could easily take my grant But you don't know what it means to me, Jolene Jolene, 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 Jolene I'm begging of you, please don't take my grant Jolene, 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 Jolene Please don't take it just because you can out a couple of verses there. Let me do those real quick too. Now you could have your choice of dough, but I could never get funds on so short notice. You're my only hope, Jolene. And I had to have this talk with you. My research goals depend on you and whatever you decide to do, Jolene. Jolene, 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 Jolene. I'm begging of you, please don't take my grant. All right. I wonder how many people are still watching after that. <laughs> ah! Thank you so much, Rambo07. I really appreciate that enthusiasm and those hundred bits. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, I don't know. Science funding is a very competitive business, unfortunately, and it pits researchers against one another, and it really is kind of a zero-sum game in a lot of ways, and there are a lot of good people, good, smart, passionate, hard-working people, who don't make it because of that. Because we live in kind of an undressed world. Um, yeah. So... If you meet a scientist, tell you how much you, tell them how much you appreciate them, and uh, I think they'll appreciate that. Uh, but yeah, anyway. Hyro uh, says Jolene must be a horrible person to even consider that. Consider what? I'm taking the grant. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, and Dark Tarkana says somehow that was the first time I got to hear that one. Pretty good. I haven't done that one that often. Yeah. Thank you, Sinobi. 70 feet long. <laughs> the scales at a substantial 35 tons. I appreciate that follow. Welcome to Paleontologizer. I'm still getting used to these new notifications. These are all new as of today. So, uh, yeah. Ekdinos says, Danny, I appreciate you. Thank you, Ekdinos. I appreciate you. Yeah. Um. Dinosaur man. Ladina! catch value hummus bin. Thank you so much for the two months there. I really appreciate that, Lenina. Lovely. That is wonderful. Um, and Sierra Loves Nature. I'm glad you like the notifications, yeah. I've got a whole bunch of extra ones, extra ones, additional ones that I need to include there. 
Stream Elements is a lot of work to put together. That whole setup is like there's a lot of there's a lot of hours <laughs> that are required to get everything running properly. But uh, yeah, um, and there you go, Hyro. Absolutely, you can spam people with paleo art without having to think if they can pay you or not. Hyro, I'm waiting for that too. Yeah, <sighs> I want to live in a world where where you can read about new fossil discoveries in the morning. Stream in the afternoon. You know, work on artwork after dinner, and then just like, chill out and watch movies before you go to bed, and never have to worry about where your next meal is going to come from or something like that. You know, it's possible. We could live in that world if we had enough people on our side. Um, Spiderberger says, so if you got to rename a dinosaur, what would it be, and what would you rename it to make it more accurate to what we know now? That's an interesting question, Spino Breaker. Um, I would... I would quarrel with the, the framing of the question just a little bit. Unfortunately, or for better or for worse, if an animal has a certain name, we usually don't change it. Unless it turns out that it had an older name before, then usually we get rid of the more recent name. Um... The, the newer one is called a junior synonym and it gets the boot. We were talking about this earlier on the stream. So usually dinosaurs don't get renamed. It's just that it turns out that two dinosaurs we used to think were different end up being the same thing. That's the case with Draco Rex and Stygimoloch and Pachycephalosaurus. It turns out they're all just Pachycephalosaurus as far as we know. It seems to be the same thing with Numingia and Elmosaurus like we were talking about earlier with this new paper. Um, with this paper right here that we were talking about that we went over in chat. Here, let me go to the very top. Um, yeah, this new paper. So usually we don't rename dinosaurs. Um, but let's see, what would you rename it to to make it more accurate to what we know now? If I had to, like, change a dinosaur name, a name that's kind of misleading, um... That's not the way that things work in paleontology, but if I had to rename a dinosaur to something less misleading, maybe I would rename Oviraptor. I'll tell everybody a quick story. Uh, let me see if I can find this. Um, there's an illustration that I did a while back that I think you might appreciate. It is, it makes a point um, that I think you might appreciate. Oh shoot, where is that? I hope I have it. Uh, mm -hmm. View all albums. Portfolio, here we go. Hopefully it's in there. Uh, no, it's not, darn it. Shoot. Well, okay, I can show you without the illustration that I did. Um, back in the 1920s, there was this huge scientific expedition that left the United States headed for Mongolia. Um, it was called the Central Asiatic Expeditions. Uh, and yeah, it was like this vast fleet of motor, motor cars, which were really new at the time, and then a big caravan of camels to resupply the motor cars. Um, Really famous imagery. Central Asiatic expeditions, they were a big deal. They were looking for the remains of ancient humans in the first place. The people who were running this expedition thought that humanity may have originated in Asia. They were wrong. It turns out people first evolved in Africa. But anyway, uh, they didn't find any ancient human remains, much to their chagrin, but what they did find were dinosaurs. Hundreds and hundreds of dinosaur fossils, including... Um, the first known, or really first described, dinosaur nests. And so this was a huge deal. Dinosaur eggs had never really been found in proliferation like this before. It was a big deal. Front page news all over the world. Dinosaur eggs. Really exciting stuff. And they're trying to figure out which dinosaur they came from. Um, and uh, they assumed that they came from... This critter right here, Protoceratops, this is its beak. 
Here's a picture of some baby protoceratops emerging from some eggs. Um, yeah. This dinosaur, they found tons and tons and tons of them. Uh, in fact, yeah. <laughs> there you have these dinosaurs, protoceratops. This is an older illustration of these critters with their eggs and everything. And actually, let's take a closer look at that because this kind of tells the story right there. So here's protoceratops right here. Um, and they found, you know, all of these nests of eggs, and they found hundreds of protoceratops skeletons. So they assumed, oh yeah, these eggs, they gotta be protoceratops eggs. It's the only thing that makes sense. But then they found something else, too. They found a skeleton of a little theropod dinosaur, a meat-eating dinosaur, uh, on top of one of these nests. And it looks like its skull had been crushed. And it has this weird, kind of bizarre skull. I'll see if I can show you an image. Um, uh, let's see. Mm -hmm. It's tough to find in a, like the perfect image for this kind of thing. Um, anyway, it had like a really weird toothless beak, and the assumption was. This critter died on top of the protoceratops' nest because it was stealing the eggs. They named the animal Oviraptor, which literally means egg thief. And so the idea that this was that this was like a specialist egg thief, egg robber. It was specialized in stealing other dinosaurs' eggs and eating them. You've probably heard of this dinosaur before if you grew up in the 1980s or 1990s. You see Oviraptor in a lot of children's books. And it's almost always, you know eating some eggs like this. In fact, um, mm -hmm. um, yeah, here's another illustration of it eating some protoceratops eggs. Uh, it was in the movie Dinosaur, that Disney movie from the year 2000, it stole some eggs. Um, yeah, here's a sculpture of a, an overaptor holding an egg. It was the egg thief dinosaur. Everybody knew it as that. And so basically, from the 1920s up until the 1990s, like 70 years basically, every children's dinosaur book had a picture of an oviraptor stealing and eating some eggs. That's what it was. Oviraptor, the egg thief. Then, in uh, the early 1990s, another crew from the United States uh, got the permission of the Mongolian government to go over to Mongolia and try and find some more fossils. Revisit some of these old sites and trying to see if try to see if more was there that they could study. And boy howdy did they find a lot of dinosaurs. Made some really incredible discoveries. Including another over after. Um, also on top of a nest of protoceratops eggs. And come on mouse. Um, there we go right there. This is a remarkable fossil. But you'll notice something interesting about it. This is an oviraptor skeleton. You're looking at it from the bottom up. So up toward its rib cage right here. These are its legs that are folded underneath its body. These are the arms kind of wrapping around these eggs. This is not stealing the eggs. This is an oviraptor sitting on top of the eggs. It became increasingly obvious that this animal was not an egg thief. It was sitting on top of its own nest. You know, it wasn't a nest marauder, it was a nest protector. This is an animal that was protecting its own nest, maybe from a sandstorm, maybe from a collapsing sand dune, something like that, but it died trying to protect its eggs. So, it's not an egg thief, it's a caring, devoted parent. So for years and years and years, Oviraptor had been slandered. Turns out, it was a wonderful parent. And yet we still have to keep the name Oviraptor, Egg Thief, because that is the original name. That's what the rules say. You don't get rid of names just because of a misinterpretation or like they got something wrong in the original description like that. You still gotta keep the name, even if the name is misleading. But if I were to change any dinosaur's name, if for whatever reason 
that became necessary, and I had to choose a dinosaur to rename, it would probably be over after. Yeah. Because it wasn't an egg thief, as far as we know. Uh, so yeah, yeah, I hope that's a good enough answer for you. Um, Spino Breaker. Yeah. Over after. Its name doesn't suit it well enough. And Solid Gray Fox, I do illustrations of dinosaurs too, yeah. I'm trying to find... I could hook up my other hard drive, but it might crash the stream. Uh, but yeah, um, I did an illustration of Overraptor sitting atop his nest for, uh, for the Badlands Dinosaur Museum in Dickinson, North Dakota, which I might be visiting over the summer. We'll have to see. I might do a stream from there. But uh, yeah, yeah, it's, it's a lot of fun. And I say his nest... Because Dave Vericchio, uh, who is actually my undergraduate advisor at Montana State, um, uh, he thinks that, much like with emus or ostriches or cassowaries nowadays, modern flightless birds, what some people might, might deign to call primitive birds, in all of those birds, the male, the father, is the one who actually takes care of all the offspring. And he sits on the nest and... You know, takes care of the chicks and everything else. So Dave Vericchio thinks that dinosaurs probably did the same thing. And here, and I'll put this link in chat for you. Here's another illustration that I did uh, for this paper for Dave a number of years ago. This is published in 2016. Um, he wanted like a really simple kind of schematic, cartoony illustration of dinosaurs uh, sitting atop their nests. Um, so yeah, so that's what I gave him. Very simple, schematic-y, cartoony. But here's like an evolutionary family tree right here. Um, let me show you. Um, starting off at Theropoda, these are the two-legged, mostly meat-eating dinosaurs. Like this guy, this is a terat uh not Teratosaurus, excuse me, Torvosaurus. They seem to have buried their eggs in the ground, in like an earthen nest like that. Then you move up more toward birds, you have the Manoraptorans, like Velociraptor and Deinonychus and Archaeopteryx and other ones like that. There's an Overaptor right there, very simple one, with a little male si symbol because uh, Dave thinks that the male Overaptors probably the sat on their nests, just like uh, modern birds. Long and 14 feet high. Lineski, feet. thanks for the follow. Um, there's a Troodon right there, too, another Manoraptorin. Uh, and then moving into birds, we've got some quote unquote primitive birds like an Antiornithines. And uh, Neornithines, modern birds, like a duck. Uh, so, yeah, this is just kind of showing what we know of dinosaurs and their nesting behavior based on fossils. So, we've got nests from Tetnurin theropods like Torvosaurus. Overaptorosaurs like Overaptor, Troodontids like Troodon, and Antiornith birds, and uh, modern birds too. So, kind of the uh, the evolution of nesting behavior in dinosaurs, both extinct and extant. Um, so yeah, yeah. Uh, and there you go. Names don't reflect biology and phylogeny. Exactly, Hyro. It's a good point. Yeah. Uh. And yeah, based on its beak, some occasional egg eating isn't even out of the picture. Yeah, Hyro, that's the funny thing, is that over after... It, I'm sure that animal would eat some eggs if you put them in front of it. Just like probably any theropod would. Eggs are like a simple, easy-to-catch source of protein, you know? If you get a chance to gobble up some eggs, you're going to do it. There are even some, like, quote-unquote herbivorous animals that will eat eggs if you give them the chance. Um, but yeah... And let's see. And Claire, yeah, Avies is the, the Latin name for bird. This is true. Uh, uh, yeah. Anyway, uh, optic nervous says they definitely aren't reptiles. Who aren't reptiles? Dinosaurs. Here's the thing. Reptile is not really a super useful word in the scientific sense. Because I mean, dinosaurs are reptiles, I guess, but if dinosaurs are reptiles, then birds are also reptiles. 
because birds are dinosaurs. So yeah, so the word reptile, in the way that most people use it, is not really, it's not a good cladistic term. Um, it doesn't reflect real, real classification in, in a way that's, like, intuitive or makes sense. Um, because birds fall under dinosaurs, they're part of the dinosaur category. Think of this like a big Russian nesting doll. Smaller dolls inside of it. So you've got birds. And birds are a kind of dinosaur, and dinosaurs are a kind of reptile. So birds are a kind of reptile, if that's the case. And then you keep going out and out and out, and then all creatures with backbones uh, turn out to be fish, if you go out far enough. That's why a lot of these terms like reptile, amphibian, you know, bird, fish, these aren't really like good scientific terms. They're used in casual conversation between, you know, people, regular people, but they're not super useful to a scientist because they don't really reflect the way that living things are actually related to one another, if that makes sense. Um, and I can show you if I can catch up to chat. There's a really cool, like, tree of life tool that I want to share with you. Uh... And optic nerve says, so when it comes to comparing dinosaurs to reptiles, how close would you say the modern family of Varanidae is to prehistoric reptiles? Optic nerve, that's a wonderful question. Um, shoot, let's see here. Uh, there are some prehistoric reptiles that are Varanids, or are ex at least very close to Varanids. Um, Mosasaurs are a wonderful example. So these, these great big, like, ocean lizards, you probably saw one in the movie Jurassic World, maybe. Um, this is a real animal. It wasn't actually that big in real life. They get up to about 30 feet long. Um, maybe 40 feet long. But they are giant ocean-going lizards. And they actually kind of gave birth to live young, like you see right here. Um, but these are related to modern animals like Komodo dragons and monitor lizards. Um... Yeah, they basically are just giant ocean-going varanids, which is super cool. Uh, but varanid lizards are not closely related to dinosaurs. Because they're lizards. Dinosaurs are actually very far from lizards on the, the grand tree of life. Or at least on... At least in their neighborhood, in vertebrate animals, um, lizards and dinosaurs are not particularly close at all. Yeah. Um... And Chef Thomas wants to know, did different birds evolve from different theropods, or did all modern birds evolve from the same common ancestor theropod? The second one, yeah. As far as we know, all birds sprang from a single ancestral theropod. Birds are a monophyletic clade like that. As far as we know, there was one lucky dinosaur that gave rise to all modern birds. And it would have been sometime in probably like the middle to late Jurassic. Sometime a little bit before Archaeopteryx, I would guess. Yeah. Um, but yeah, yeah. We're all just fish. That's true, Lenina. It is true. Yeah. I mean, if you want to use the word fish, yeah. And you work with varanids on a daily basis? That's cool. so cool, Optic Nerve. Yeah. Yeah, varanids, or at least maybe the ancestor of varanids. I don't know how far back varanidae actually goes in the fossil record, but they gave rise to mosasaurs and to snakes. Snakes seem to be very closely related to varanid lizards. Um, I, I guess they're not part of varanidae, but they're they're very close. Yeah. Um, and Hyro says most mosasaur workers place them closer to snakes by now, I think. Is that right, Hyro? I, I might be a little bit out of date on this. I remember back when I was in high school, um, I was hanging out with, uh, with Jason Head, who's a... He works on fossil snakes. He described Titanoboa, actually. Um, he was spending some time at UCMP when I was there. And I was asking him, like, what's the current thinking on mosasaurs and snakes? Did snakes evolve from mosasaurs? Did mosasaurs evolve from the ancestor of... Like, what's the deal there? And he's like, it's all a big mess. Nobody really knows. But he thought that mosasaurs and snakes were, were not super close. Um, but I don't know. Uh, maybe that's changed in the time since then. I know a lot of 
ancestral snakes have been found in the time since then. So, I wonder what Wikipedia has to say about this. Wikipedia is often a really good, like, quick and dirty source for this sort of thing. Um, so let's check. Osasaurs! Extinct large marine reptiles containing 40 genera. That's it? Only 40 genera? Uh, Squamata includes lizards and snakes. Yep. Uh, so let's look at classification. Uh, 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 lower classifications. Let's see. Uh, revealed new morphological support for molecular results that recovered Mesosauria as a sister clade to Serpentes. Uh, interesting. Another approach was developed by R. Alexander Pyron in a 2016 study which also recovered Mesosauria as a sister clade to the Serpentes. Cool. Very cool. Um, yeah, I think the jury's still out, but it sounds like you're... If there's any kind of consensus forming, it might be the one you're talking about, Hyro. Yeah. Yeah. Ha. Huh. Um, yeah. Links, cite all your sources. Claire, well, here. Let me put this in chat for you. There you go. Um, but yeah, yeah. And... But per Squamata, the tree is a mess. Yeah, I bet, Hyro. Yeah. At least we have modern representatives that you can do, like, you know, try and make molecular trees with. Um, for other stuff, like, uh, if you're trying to place ichthyosaurs or placodonts or, heaven forbid, thalatosaurs, if you're trying to figure out where they fall out on the reptile family tree, like, holy moly. Yeah. I don't even know if we're positive that these things are diapsids or anapsids or uriapsids or whatever. I don't even know if some of those terms are still used, like uriapsida. Um, but yeah. Um, oh, no worries, Claire. <laughs> uh, and Chef Thomas, no, 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 no. I can't cite my brain, and I'm not an expert on mosasaurs. Holy cow, am I not? I've never done any work on mosasaurs. I only know what other colleagues have told me and what I see on Wikipedia, for crying out loud. So I'm definitely not an expert on Mosasaurus. Heavens no. Um, but let me show you a cool little uh, tool that I found recently. Um, let's see. It is called the One Zoom Tree of Life Explorer. Um, and I will put the link in chat right here. It is really, really cool. Um, but let's take a look at Squamata, maybe. There we go. Oh, this is cool. So, this is the grand tree of life right here. Just keep zooming out and out and out. Uh, and there we go. Nice. So, when we talk about how to classify living things, the way that scientists actually do it is based on their ancestry. Now that we actually understand evolution to a certain degree, life kind of makes more sense. When I say life, I mean living things and how they're related to each other, why they share certain characteristics or why they don't. You know, why do all animals have DNA and why do their different DNA sequences have certain amounts in common with each other and not with other creatures. It turns out, the closer you have, like, the closer you are in terms of your DNA similarity to another animal, the closer related you are. Because your last common ancestor is more recent. Hopefully this, I can use this tool in the future to kind of show rather than just tell when we're coming to something like this. So, uh, by way of example, let's look at, uh, at Varanid Lizards. Uh, so we'll start off here. All life. The most recent common ancestor to today is all life. So, this part of the tree is, you know, comprises all of life. Things will get more and more specific 
as we branch out to different points. And bear with me, I'm kind of learning how to use this tool to try and teach. I've only seen this a couple of times, so... Um, but... Uh, 2.125 billion years ago, or 2,125 million years ago, during the Ryassian period, lived the most recent common ancestor of today's archaea and eukaryotes. So back then, living things are basically just tiny little one-celled organisms. And then they continue to diversify and diversify until you get to all kinds of other creatures. Up here, you've got all kinds of different bacteria and stuff. But we're going to keep marching on, get to our monitor lizards. Um, there we go. Yeah. Uh, this is like before we even have fossils, really. Um, get more and more specific here. Eukaryotes. These are living things that have a nucleus in their cell. They don't have their genetic material just strewn about all willy-nilly throughout the cell, centralized in like their, the brain of the cell, the nucleus. Um, so all of these different creatures are all different eukaryotes. You can see it's a pretty diverse group, everything from ladybugs to sponges to uh, songbirds to kelp. Uh, and quinoa. <laughs> um, and there we go, amorphia. Uh, another group. I'm not even sure what these are. And then you have animals, fungi, and more. But we're going to keep on cruising through here. Holozoa. Um, more animals and more. Yeah. And this is really important. I love... There's a lot of different, like, visualizers for the Tree of Life online. This is my favorite so far because it actually has the divergence point. So 650 million years ago lived the common ancestor of all of these different creatures. So there was a creature back then whose, an whose descendants later diversified into every single creature that you see here. And we can figure this out through things like DNA. So all of these creatures have DNA more closely, like that's closer to each other than they do to, to any of the creatures that we've seen so far um, on those different splitting off points. Um, doing the Ediacaran, yeah. You've got uh, kind of more what you might call complex animals. Down further and further, bilaterally symmetrical animals. So these are creatures whose sides are bilaterally symmetrical. So if you cut them down the middle, the left side is the same as the right side, just mirrored, flipped. Bilateral symmetry. That's kind of a, I don't know, more advanced animals, to use kind of scare quotes, have uh, bilateral symmetry. Uh, Nephrozoans. So we're starting to get into, like, deuterostomes. These are creatures with jaws. Or some kind of, like, opening at the front of their body that's different from the opening at the back. Protostomes. Uh, yeah, let's see. We're gonna cruise through these here a little bit. And what did I miss here? At some point, the vertebrates branch off. And that would have been down here at deuterostomes, huh? Protostomes. Arrow worms. Nephrozo. Here we go. We took a wrong turn. But now we're at Deuterostomes. These are basically animals with a mouth. Um, chordates. These are vertebrate animals. Animals with a backbone. Uh, or at least the beginnings of a backbone. Things like lancelets. And then, of course, we get to... I don't know what these are. These are like true vertebrates, I guess? Uh, here's true vertebrates. Jawed vertebrates. So that's everything except for the jawless fishes. Bony vertebrates. So these are basically every creature that you see here, you could call a fish, because they evolved, they all evolved from a fish ancestor. And then some of them split off and do different things. Ray finned fishes go off this way. You've got all different kinds of fishes over there, all doing their own thing. So the fishes kind of branch off and do their own thing, but even though this creature here would have been something similar to a fish. Uh, Lobefin fishes, including tetrapods. So this is like uh, coelacanths are part of this group. And here coelacanths go off and do their thing there. And then lungfishes and tetrapods. There's lungfishes there. 
Uh, tetrapods, amniotes, seropsids. There we go. Lepidosaurs. These are lizards and snakes and critters like that. Um, and tuataras as well. Squamates are... Let's see. Lizards and snakes right here. There we go. And then coming off of them, we have... Let's see. Where would our varanids be? Um, iguanas. Snakes. Okay, it's something close to this. Oh, Clytostes Intermedius. That's a Mosasaur right there. I didn't know they had Mosasaurs in here. That's really cool. Platycarpus is another Mosasaur. So we're getting close to our Varanid Lizards. We're almost done with this exercise. Uh, let's see here. Monitor Lizards! Here we go. Um, and then look, we'll go all the way down to Komodo Dragon right here. It just gets more and more specific. Uh... There's our Komodo dragon. So, you've just gone on a journey from the origin of all animals all the way to a specific, you know, individual species. Uh, Komodo, no, Varanus komodoensis, Komodo dragon. Uh, yeah. So let's zoom out. See if you can keep your eye on this part. See if you can, like, you know, track this as we zoom out further and further. This is like that thing at the baseball game where they have, uh, like, the baseball goes under a hat and there's two other hats and they move around a whole bunch. You try and keep track of where it is. Try and do that as we zoom out. Keep your eye on the Komodo dragon. We zoom out further and we get to lizards. Uh, these are just monitor lizards still at this point. Right there. So, you still have your eye on it? There's other lizards. Squamates. Lepidosaurs. Tetrapods. These are all land-living vertebrate animals. These are all, like, animals with legs and a backbone. They're represented right here. Lungfishes. Bony vertebrates. Jawed vertebrates. Vertebrate animals. Chordates. Just scooting out further and further. Now we can see animals and their relatives too. Then we can see creatures with a nucleus in their cells. And then all the way out till you get to all of life. Quite the journey, right? This is one of the things that's so cool to me about evolutionary biology is that we can actually figure out how all these different creatures are related to one another. We can draft up a great tree of life and try and make sense of the creatures that we share our world with. It's really cool. And we're not doing this based on something arbitrary. You know, not based on appearances or some vague hunch or something like that. It's based on real evidence. I mean, we, can, we argue about the specifics because we have incomplete amounts of information. And the more we find out, the clearer and clearer this picture gets. But it is a truly beautiful picture. And it just really makes you appreciate the diversity and wonder of these living things that we share our planet with. It's... I find that really inspiring. Um, and I hope you do too. I hope that wasn't too tedious right there. <laughs> um, but yeah, yeah. Uh, and yeah, Hyro, yeah, Seropterygia and Ichthyosaurs are still jumping around a lot in the tree. I bet, yes. Um, and Smurf Berry Barbecue says, I enjoy my bilateral symmetry. I do too. It's pretty nice having, you know, the same amount of arms on this side that I have on this side. You know? Makes my life a little easier, for sure. Um, and Hazanku says, when nature got crazy. There you go, Hazanku. Yeah. Welcome to Paleontologizer, by the way. Uh, looks like you picked the perfect time to join us. Um, yeah. And Moosey Fate says, why are some red and some green? That's a great question, Moosey Fate. Well, let me show you. Let's return to our Komodo dragon. Varanus komodoensis. There we go. And we'll zoom way in. Oh, I didn't know this. I'm not touching anything. 
It'll zoom in automatically for us. That's so cool. Look at that. <laughs> oh, that is so neat. So, this is red because these critters are endangered. Uh, they're considered vulnerable on the IUCN red list. So there aren't very many of them left, and they are in danger of extinction. So, yeah, they're, uh... We need to take care of them so we don't lose them. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, anyway, let's get some audience participation here. Full-time dinosaur paleontologists. Chris Beaver! Thank you for the five gift subs. Are leading this expedition. <laughs> Thank you so much, Chris Beaver. I really appreciate your support. Thank you so much. CHRSBVR just gifted five subs. <laughs> CHRSBVR. Chris Beaver, how are you doing? Welcome back to Paleontologizing. I hope you're having a great summer. Um, hope things have been good. Hope you're staying nice and cool. Thank you for your ongoing support, Chris Beaver. It means so much to me. It really does. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, all good here? Thanks, Danny. Thank you, Chris Beaver. Thank you very much. Chris Beaver, you will be excited to know, I think, that this coming Thursday, I'm leaving on my great big cross-country road trip, um, visiting different museums and field sites all across the American West. I still don't know if I have any real field work coming up. I sent some emails out about that today. But here's the thing. We're at a crossroads right now, Chris Beaver. I might be doing some field work uh, starting in, like, the beginning of August, possibly. But if I don't, then that is when Lordy, from Cooking with Lordy, will be joining me. Uh, and then we will be doing a great big road trip all across the country, um, visiting different field sites, and different museums and stuff like that, and streaming all the while. It's going to be really cool. Uh, so I'm already driving up through... California and Nevada and Utah and Wyoming and Montana and I'm doing some cool stuff in Montana after that the split happens I either leave and do field work in Montana and try and stream that or Lordy joins me and we end up cruising across uh, going east out to the Great Lakes and then southwest down to the Grand Canyon stopping at museums and stuff like that along the way so it's gonna be a really cool summer either way really can't lose I'm not sure which of those I'd be more excited about, honestly. Um, so yeah, yeah, it is going to be really, really neat. And I hope you can join us for part of it, Chris Beaver. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, sounds like a great plan. This is going to be fun. It's going to be a lot of fun. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, but anyway, let's get some audience participation here on this grand tree of life. Um, and uh, somebody... You know, give me a an organism, preferably, I guess, a living organism. They don't seem to have very many fossil texts on here. Um, I'll type something in. If I remember, it's Latin binomial. They might take common names, too. And we'll zoom into that. I'm guessing this part of the tree is going to be way overrepresented. Because these are most of the kind of charismatic creatures that you can think of. And I should specify, or rather, whatever the opposite of specify is doesn't have to be an animal. In fact, it might be better if it's not. It's some other creature. Uh, iguana, iguana. <laughs> that's, that's a good one. I like that a lot. The green iguana, iguana, iguana. That's going to be pretty close to where our veranda was. There we go. And I think I can just click this and it'll zoom right in. But here we go. There we go. Oh, that is cool. Uh, it almost gives you like a falling kind of effect. And there you go, green iguana. Least concerned. They are very common, those iguanas. They definitely are. Um, Venus flytrap, Rodan. I like that a lot. That's a great one. And one, well, let's do E. coli first for one Pakadampu. Um, what's it? S. Sericia? Uh,. I don't know how to spell that. Let's just do E, hopefully, E. coli. Uh, there we go. Uh, Esericia, oh, I had it right. 
It just took a while to load. There we go, taking us down a completely different path here. Oh, that is so cool. <laughs> I love how you could just fire it and it just goes. This is really, really cool. It just keeps going. Holy moly. <laughs> wow. It's not even stopped yet. How, how long is this going to go? So the, the diversity of bacteria is just astonishing. Um, and you think about how few species of bacteria have actually been named compared to other creatures. Look at that. Look at that! Three streams later, lol. <laughs> Optic nerve. There we go, yeah! Holy cow. And this must be like a specific strain of Escherichia coli. Am I saying that right? I don't know if I've ever actually heard anybody pronounce the genus name for E. coli. Uh, by the way, um, if you've ever, uh, you know, you've heard of E. coli, You've heard of T-Rex. Both of those are nicknames for the animal's full scientific name. In this case, Esterichia coli, E. coli, for Tyrannosaurus rex, T-Rex. You know, you can abbreviate any animal's scientific name that way, or any plant or other organism, too. So, like, Homo sapiens, our scientific name, H. sapiens. And you see that sometimes in the scientific literature. So, yeah. I, uh, rather than zooming all the way out, I'm just going to reload the page and hope, hope that it uh, brings us back to the full tree. There we go. Uh, and let's see. What was another one? Venus flytrap from Rodan. Let's find that. Uh, I'll give it a second to think. There we go. Uh, Dionea muscapula. Interesting. There we go. <laughs> Very cool. Venus flytrap. They are vulnerable. I did not know that. Wow. And I guess you can sponsor these. That's kind of neat. Um, you'll see it's usually like the most uh, charismatic creatures that are ones that get sponsored. Um, very, very cool. All right. Zoom out from the plants. Incredible. This is so cool. Alright. Uh, miracles of fractal geometry. There you go, wrote down. Um, <laughs> and who else have we got? Let's see. SARS Cove 2. I don't know if that would be on here. Um, but let's check. SARS. No. SARS Shrimp. SARS Wolf Eel. I don't think viruses are considered living things for the purposes of this tree. Um, and V Mongoliensis. There you go, Lenina. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, the Bilby. Ah, oh, that's a great one. Uh, let's see. Uh, it's a great one, Spino Breaker. Yeah. Marsupial mammal. This will be interesting given that it's a marsupial. And they are vulnerable. Ah, oh, they're so cute. I wonder where they get the photos from. They're probably from Wikipedia, from Wikimedia Commons. Yeah, these are pretty close to uh, Bandicoot and Numbats. Man, Australian mammals have the best names. Uh, cool Tars. <laughs> uh, Tasmanian Devils. Very cool. Very cool. Anyway. Uh... Oh, Echidna. Old Mama Dragon, thank you for the follow. I appreciate that. Welcome to Paleontologizer. Yeah. Um... Okay, let's see. Uh -huh. Echidna. That's a good one. Um, echidnas, there's two species of echidna. Let me find that real quick. 
It'll be not too far from our marsupial mammals. We'll try the short beaked echidna. Uh, yeah. But very cool. Yeah. Oh, nice. Nice, Claire Burr. I like that you made a command for that. Um, least concern? I didn't know that these guys were that common. That's, that's good news. I would have assumed that any kind of monetary mammal... Oh. Well, these ones are critically endangered. Ah. Uh, that's so sad. This is so cool, too, that it, it actually has the Wikipedia page for each of them. Um, just readily accessible. Uh, very neat. So these guys, like, are early off-branch from mammals. Monotremes, the egg-laying mammals. So all of these critters right here, platypuses and echidnas, all, they're the only mammals today that lay eggs. They used to be much more diverse. Monotremes used to be, like, half of all mammals back during the age of dinosaurs. Um, yeah. And then, uh, Therian mammals really, I don't know, they're the ones that really survived the asteroid impact and diversified to the point where most, almost all mammals today are Therian mammals. Those are mammals that give birth to live young. Those are placental and marsupial mammals. You know, kangaroos don't lay eggs. They give life birth to. Um, yeah. So, yeah, anyway. And we'll be do a couple more, and then I'll wrap up the stream, I think. Uh, candy cone, candy cane snail, that's a great one, Spino Breaker. But we already did one of yours. Uh, let's see. That's a good one, Spino Breaker, but we'll give a turn to somebody else, I think. Um, Snurf Berry Barbecue says, Neoclinus, uh, Blanchard Eye, a Sarcastic French Head. Interesting, that's a great name. <laughs> you gotta love common names like that. That's wonderful. Um, that sounds like some sort of little ornate fish. Little, uh, Osteichthian fish. Oh, very cool. It looks like a frog mouth, almost. Um, interesting. Very interesting. Where's the parent page for this? Sarcastic French head. Very, a small but very hardy saltwater fish that has a large mouth and aggressive territorial behavior, for which it has been given its common name. Really neat. Here's one living in a plastic tube, apparently. Oh, do they live in tubes? Are they a reef fish? That's super neat. Um, very cool. Anyway, we'll do, like, a couple more, and then I'll wrap this stream up. Because I've got some other stuff i got to get done tonight. Um, time is running out until i got to leave for... Uh, and Ikoala says tardigrade. Yeah, let's look up... Tardigrades, there are a bunch of different species. But we will go to their whole group, the water bearers, tardigrata. And they are... There we go, yeah. Um, we don't have to zoom in that far because they're pretty basal on the animal family tree, I think, right? They are animals, right? Yeah, protostomes. Yeah, water bears. And there's so many different kinds. I mean, yeah, look at that. Um, here's one right here. Milnesium Berlin <laughs> Berlinaticorum. No common name. <laughs> Some of these creatures are obscure enough to the general public that they don't actually have, like, a common name. Like, um, you know, like Smithson's Common Water Bear, or anything like that. Or, like, the Northern Reticulated Water Bear. They just don't have a common name. It's just, they're only known by their Latin binomial. Uh, for this case, it would be M. Berladnicorum, if you want to nickname it. Like, you nickname T-Rex. M. Berladnicorum. Um... Pretty cool. Uh, and let's see. Uh, peacock mantis shrimp. That's a great one, optic nerve. I love that we've like figured out a new uh, a new segment for this for this channel. Cool stuff that we can do. Peacock mantis shrimp. There we go. Buckle up, everybody. 
Ah, oh, that's so cool. Very, very neat. I wish they had better, like, photos. Some of these are a little bit... That's a much better one. Look at that fancy little guy. Very cool. Um, yeah. Uh, the Western Violet-Faced Water Bear. There you go, Smurf Bear. <laughs> um, and Moosey Fate says, I assume you don't get to common name it if you sponsor it. No. No. Common names are a funny thing because they're not, like, official. There's no, like, I don't think there's an official registry of common names for animals. I think there is for plants. But plants have a whole different naming system than animals do. They've got a different code that governs all the rules for how you can name them. The ICZN, the International Code for Zoological Nomenclature, is the one we have for animals. I don't know what it is for plants. But here's a funny thing. You can actually have... You know how I said, like, two animals cannot have the same scientific name? You would have to, like, get rid of a name or rename it if you mess up and give an animal a name that's already in use? You can overlap names for animals and plants. So, it kind of makes me wonder if there are any plants that have, like, famous binomials from animals. If there's a plant that's also called Homo sapiens, or E. coli, or Tyrannosaurus rex. Because um, you could do that. It's not against rules, apparently. They should probably make a rule for that, but I don't know. I've never been one for making more rules, to be honest. Uh... And the parovirus, I don't think it would be optic nerve. I don't think viruses are. CMC Airboss, thank you for the seven months of support. I really appreciate that. Thank you very much, Airboss. Wonderful. Welcome back, by the way. Hope you're doing well. Uh, there would be a bird of paradise for both. Yeah, Moosey Fate, yeah. But that's a common name. That's not a Latin name. The ones that you see in italics that sound all hard to pronounce. Um, and there's a great one. Uh, let's see. Did I steal that one? Lice. My Citron Americanum. Ah, uh, did I spell it wrong? No, there's no R. Lysiton. Skunk cabbage. Let's just search that. Uh, there we go. Swamp cabbage. <laughs> uh, that's a good one, Sierra Loves Nature. Yeah. Um, very, very cool. Yeah. Neat stuff. I wish there was a button that I could push that would just zoom back out. But instead, I have to keep reloading the page. Um, the mayor space. Yeah, common names are colloquial. I don't think there's any official governing body for them. Maybe not even for plants. I'm not sure. Um, yeah. Uh, Lucy Fate says it would be crazy if the Homo sapiens branched off to the Facebook catalog of everyone. <laughs> Shit, let's search for Homo sapiens real quick. Maybe we'll make that our last one. So you ready, everybody? Buckle in. And uh, we'll go see where we belong on this grand tree of life. Here we go. There we go. On just like a branch of a branch of another branch. You're near our closest living relatives. Gorillas, bonobos, and other chimps. And there's us. Um, yep. Uh... You could sponsor this leaf for a friend. It makes a great gift. <laughs> I said that the most charismatic creatures are going to be the ones that are sponsored. What does that say about us, everybody? We need to up our game. Uh, yeah. And I like that. Are you seeing red list status? Least concern. Doesn't seem like we're going to go extinct anytime soon. Uh, at least not before a lot of other creatures, unfortunately. But yeah, yeah. Uh, oh, and hang on. 
Uh, Rodan said, what are the three species right here? Well, six million years ago, during the Neogene period, lived the most recent common ancestor to species, to the species including chimpanzees, humans, and bonobos. So yeah, we are, uh, those are our closest living relatives, chimps and bonobos. Pretty cool. That's why we share so much DNA with those creatures. It's the vast majority of our genome. We're almost identical to chimps in terms of our DNA. Uh, yeah. Oh, and Claire Burr want to know if this is my Triceratops at the Burke Museum? It might be. Can I show this picture? Um, I mean, it's not my Triceratops. Um, uh, I don't know how good a skull we had for this critter. This would have been Denver's trike? Um, I'm not sure. When did the skull go up? Because we dug that one up in 2014. So if this skull was up before then, then it's not the one that, that we excavated. Um, but yeah, just to fill everybody in, in 2014, uh, me and Denver Fowler and Jack Wilson uh, and a few other people we had this little tiny field crew up in the Hell Creek in Montana, and uh, we kind of glommed on to another bigger field crew from the Burke Museum in Seattle, Washington. And they're all mammal people, so they dig up mammals. They didn't really know how to dig up dinosaurs. And so they asked us to join them and find them some dinosaurs for their museum and help them dig them up. And so we spent the second half of that summer doing exactly that digging up dinosaurs for them and showing them how dinosaur paleontologists dig up a dinosaur. It's very different from digging up tiny little Mesozoic mammals who don't have any bits that are bigger than that um, for the most part. Maybe their jaws might be about that big for like a big honking huge Mesozoic mammal. Um, but for the most part they're very tiny. And uh, yeah, so Denver Fowler had some coordinates for a triceratops that he'd found years before and so we're like yeah let's go find this triceratops for you again and you can dig it up and you can bring it back to your museum because they needed like a display piece they were trying to find some more dinosaurs to bring in some crowds because believe it or not crowds of people do not line up to see tiny little mesozoic mammal fragments um, unfortunately it would be cool if the general public were interested in mesozoic mammals too those are our ancestors for crying out loud they are cool they're just not as big and charismatic as dinosaurs. So yeah, we helped them dig up uh, a Triceratops. It, it got, the site got nicknamed Denver's Trike. And Denver was a little bit like, uh, about that because he was by no means the best Triceratops he'd ever found. But yeah, that might be it. I don't know. Um, and and that was Dorkabob. Oh, very cool, Claire. Thank you. Odds of this happening are so slim they are in Thank you, Jim Monster. But then on top of that, to actually find the fossil makes the world of the dinosaur hunter the world of a long shot. <laughs> I don't know how well you could hear that notification. I might need to go in and change the file there and up the volume on it, increase the gain. So I think that's as far as it goes in uh, stream elements. But thank you, Jim Monster, for the seven months there. I really appreciate your ongoing support. So thank you very much for supporting this community and supporting me. I know we all really appreciate it. Um, so yeah, yeah. Uh, and let's see. You want to go see TikTok? Me too, Lenina. Me too. Uh, yeah. And Solid Great Fox. I did hear something vague about that, but I don't know anything at all about paleoanthropology. Um, Dragon Man. I bet you people are hearing that and they're thinking like, Whoa, it's a Dragon Man? Like, no, that's a nickname that's given to, uh, you know, just like Java Man or Peking Man or, uh, Nebraska Man. <laughs> or Pilt, <laughs> Pilt Down Man. <laughs> uh, but yeah, half man, half dragon. Yeah, Smurf. <laughs> Ocean Man. Yeah, I like the song. I still need to read about that too, Sierra. Yeah, yeah. 
Was he Trogdor? I don't know, Lenina. I somehow I doubt it. Um, but yeah, yeah. Uh, but anyway, uh, I'm gonna go ahead and wrap the stream up. I was planning on ending the stream at like seven o'clock tonight, and clearly that did not happen. We were just having too much fun. So, let me go ahead and find somebody to raid here. Um, and we'll get this started. Um, oops. Come on, Streamlabs. Streamlabs is being ridiculous right now. Sorry. Uh, dashboard. There we go. Hopefully this thing refreshes. <laughs> um, looks good so far. If it hadn't been for that great dinosaur who saved Toast us from the American forces... We would all be dead. <laughs> Thank you for saving us, Toast Muncher. I really appreciate your ongoing support. Nine months, holy cow, Toast Muncher. That's a big deal. Um, that's a Twitch baby right there, Toast Muncher. Uh, thank you for all of your support. Let's see who else is live on Twitch right now and whom we can pay a raid to. Um, let's see. It doesn't look like too many people are on. But we might go see... Let's see, Tom Thinks just started. I don't know if he might be playing a video right now. Um... What's Ishirna doing? Oh, she's doing some glass blowing. You guys, you're gonna really like Ishirna's stream, I think. We'll, uh, we'll go surprise her with a gigantic raid. And, uh, we'll see the look on... on her face. Um, when we jump into there. So let me go ahead and do that. Uh, Ishirna. There we go. Come on, mouse. Please cooperate. And there we go. Thank you, everybody, for making this such a wonderful stream. I really appreciate all of you guys. Thank you so much for your viewership, your enthusiasm, your questions, your encouragement, your financial support. I love you guys. Thank you so much. And I'm really looking forward to taking you on a great big adventure. Uh, starting on Thursday. Big paleontology road trip. It's going to be awesome. So without further ado, let's go ahead and say hello to Ashirna. We're going to see some glass blowing. And, uh, oh, let me put some raid chat messages. You can copy and paste those real quick if you're a subscriber. So I'll give you a few seconds to do that. And then we will go say hello to Ashirna. You guys ready? All right. I'll see you over there. Goodness. Paleontologizing. First off, let me say thank you for that follow. We had a...